Let's go ahead and get started if we have everybody. All right, we're going to um, start this evening with the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, welcome everybody. Full house on a warm night. Thank you for coming down. Uh, roll call will show all council members present. Um, I need a motion for an approval of the agenda and affidavit of posting. So moved. I'm going <laughs> to call that a motion. Bragman, second read. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Um, the announcement of our closed session action is that we gave direction to staff. Um, let me read some meeting protocol for you. The mayor shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of orders and the council has a responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at our council meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public and to maintain standards of tolerance and civility. The Town Council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items will be heard that evening and which, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter that is not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular Council meeting unless the Council votes to suspend this rule. Please, at this time, turn off all cellular phones or place them in silent mode. We have a couple of announcements. Fairfax Food Pantry is always needing volunteers Saturdays from 9 to 11 at the Fairfax Community Church at 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. We have one vacancy on the Open Space Committee to complete an unexpired term to June 30th, 2014. There's a vacancy on the Fairfax Youth Commission for any Ross Valley youth between the ages of 14 and 19. Um, uh, there's a vacancy for a youth commissioner to serve on the Park and Rec Commission for a two-year term, a vacancy on the Affordable Housing Committee for a four-year term to June, tw June 30th, 2016. We have a couple of chipper days coming um, up on s a couple of Sundays in October, October 7th and October 14th. There will be a chipper available in the pavilion parking lot from noon to 6 p.m. for Fairfax residents only to bring down any items that they want to have chipped and chip them. Uh, we also have a Halloween parade in downtown Fairfax at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, October 31st, which is sponsored by Park and Recreation, Parks and Recreation and the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm also seeing another announcement here, which is that we have a creek cleanup on Sunday, October 14th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And you meet at 16 Park Road, which is the youth center, uh, wear closed-toed shoes, bring gloves, large clippers. This is an extraordinarily fun opportunity for you and your kids. Um, you get to go down in the creeks and tromp around and clean up brush and clean up trash and make our town a much nicer place. So I strongly recommend uh, that folks uh, check that out. The kids above seven. Kids above seven. <laughs> uh oh, I, we might have just lost the whole crown. <laughs> um, okay, and we are actually going to start our uh, meeting tonight because we, as people can see, we've got a fair number of our youth in our community. We will be doing our open um, time for public expression um, after our presentations uh, tonight. Um, and so I would like to welcome the Manor School Green Team to come up and give their presentation. Thanks so much for coming. Come right up to the podium, and if you push the button on the base of that microphone, that yes, the one that says talk, and you'll see the little light go on, and you are good to go. We are the members of the Manor School Green Team. Our names are Gwen, We are here because we want to tell you about something that we think is very important. We are hoping to get your help to make Fairfax Fairfax, a friendlier place for birds, lizards, snakes, and small mammals. It's on. You can just talk. <laughs> 
We care very much about taking care of the environment, and especially birds. My favorites are the Wilson's Warbler and the American Robin. I think birds are awesome. Remember the Lorax who speaks for the trees? Well, just like trees, birds can't speak for themselves. So we, the green team, are going to speak for the birds just like the Lorax. Unfortunately, many species of birds are endangered. There are many reasons for this, including loss of habitat. Every time people build houses and pave roads, animals lose their homes. Also, birds die because of pollution, hitting clean windows, and being hit by cars and airplanes. There are several things we can do to help birds, like putting shiny decals on windows, putting up bird feeders and bird baths, and not using pesticides. Another reason that birds are endangered is cats, both pets and feral. Scientists estimate that nationwide cats kill hundreds of millions of birds and small animals like lizards, chipmunks, rabbits, squirrels, and snakes each year. Cats kill both common and rare animals. Our state bird, the California quail, is easy prey for cats, which is that. According to the American Bird Conservancy, in one California study, on average, each outdoor cat that hunted returned 24 rodents, 15 birds, and 17 lizards to their residents each year. Those are the ones they return. If you think about how many outdoor cats there are and multiply the numbers I just mentioned, a lot of birds and small mammals and lizards are dying because of cats. Preventing cats from killing birds is something that we can do about. We can keep our cats indoors. It is better for cats to be inside, too. They are safer from predators, cars, and trucks. Cat fights and disease. Only th they live longer, too. Outdoor cats usually live only three to five years while indoor cats live over 15 years. They, there are many ways to keep cats happy indoors. Some ideas are to have lots of cat toys, cat grass, to, to keep water and food dishes full, and to have a scratching post, and to have a cozy bed. I have cats and I love them. All of us on the green team think cats are amazing. Some of us keep our cats inside, but some of us are putting cat bibs on our cats. This is a cat bib. It fits like a baby bib. It slows down the pounce of a cat. It makes it easier for the birds and small animals to get away. I think cat bibs are a great solution to protect animals and keep cats happy. We are proud of Fairfax. We were the first town to ban plastic bags, styrofoam, and make rules about pesticides. We think it would be incredible if Fairfax were the first town to commit to reducing the impact of cats on wildlife. Please, for the sake of the birds, lizards, and tiny snakes, use cat bibs on cats that go outside. Also, cats can get infections from birds if they eat them. We want to thank you for all that you do for our wonderful town of Fairfax. Thank you for listening. We are very serious about this because we love all animals, including cats. Please consider our request for you to help us save birds by keeping ca and keep cats healthier by educating people and helping supply cat bibs. Thank you very much from the Green Team. Also, we are presenting to the town of Fairfax replacement wildlife crossing signs for Sir Francis Drake Boulevard because the old ones faded. Could you please put these up? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. All right, any council? Where
is the best place for those to, them to leave those signs? With the chief. Chief will take them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the replacement signs. They're beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I bring it back to council. It's a presentation. Do we have any questions for our fine young citizens? Other than to say, Laura, as always, thank you so much for coming by. It's been too long since your last visit uh, with us, and please come back every year with a uh, great collection of your students and tell us the adventures and, and the good uh, projects that you're working on. Brian? Uh, I think that sets the tone for how meetings should be. I really do. I think that more participation from younger people brings them into the fold of what's going on and it also keeps it real for all of us who think that our ideas on these agendas are really important. When some things like this come in, it really kind of puts into perspective all the levels of importance. So well done. Okay, any comments from the public on this presentation? Valerie? I actually use cat bibs and they're really great and they really do work. The one thing that I, uh, oh, the one thing I didn't hear them mention, but maybe they did, maybe I missed it, is that you can buy them at Wild Care. They're very inexpensive. They were developed in Australia and they really are amazing. People make a lot of comments. The one thing I would say is label your bib. I had so many people try to return my cats to me when I didn't say why. They were wearing them <laughs> because they thought, I don't know what they thought. Anyway, um, uh, the other thing is that I think the other really big p point is to shut your curtains every single day on your windows. To birds, windows look like the outdoors and they break their necks by the millions. It's a really easy thing to do before you leave the house, just like locking your door, put your shades down. Thanks. Thank you, Valerie. And I'm sure um, we'll make sure some member of the council takes a look at a resolution and sees what we can do. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Okay. All right, we have another presentation. Tough act to follow. Um, potential impact of Propositions 30 and 38 on local schools. Uh, Jim Sarita, did I get that right? Sarita, actually. Sarita, yes. Uh, our business manager from the Ross Valley School District. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a tough act to follow. You stole my line. I was going to say that. Uh, wonderful children, absolutely great presentation. I'm so impressed. We have a presentation for you tonight. It's a little more um, somber in its message and its tone. It's regarding the propositions that are on the ballot for November. We do have a PowerPoint slide presentation. I don't know that you want me to go through that or I can just speak to the topics. It's so whatever the pleasure it's, of the... It's up to you. Okay. I, I will address this in a conceptual level and we can certainly talk about some of the aspects of it. Um, generally speaking, California schools are still in crisis financially. We have been in this crisis mode, unfortunately. For, it seems like forever. Uh, I've been in the business for 25 years, school business, and I... I have to go back to the early 1990s before I can remember a time when we weren't grappling with budget reductions. And I'm sure you as a, as a town have had similar experiences during this time frame. It kind of speaks to how schools are funded in California and some significant inequities. And really we have to go all the way back to the implementation of Prop 13 in 1977, 78. When local schools in California Prior to then, used to be uh, funded almost exclusively with property tax. That changed. Uh, the state of California became the primary source of funding for public schools. And what that did is it put public schools on a funding cycle that is very uh, attached to the state economy, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. Again, much like the budget of the town of, of Fairfax. We, in public education prior to that, were uh, funded by um, property taxes, almost entirely by property taxes, and they were a much more stable base of funding. So what that has yielded over time is a ever-decreasing amount, well, I should say that differently, the rest of the nation 
uh, developed and continue to develop public education funding where California started to fall behind, such that since that time frame, uh, we are now about $3,000, nearly $3,000 per pupil uh, funding levels below the national average over the last 20 years. Um, and what that has also resulted in in California is a number of uh, funding issues such that we as a state are ranked near or at the bottom in per pupil spending and per pupil uh, revenue and so forth. So ultimately the state of California has just not been keeping up with public education finance simply to keep us even with inflation. Fast forward to the last five years, the most recent time frame, we've uh, once again been subjected to significant funding reductions. The only difference between this time and the previous episodes is this is much more severe. We're looking at the possibility of a 28% funding deficit in the current year if Proposition 30 doesn't pass. Currently, we have a 22% deficit. Um, the peak deficit in our financing uh, prior to this most recent era was 11%. So you can see we're already double that. We're threatened, if you will, for lack of a better word, to be pushed closer to tripling that number uh, as a result of Prop 30 passing or failing. So there, there's some more to the history in the slides and the handouts. So I'll let you uh, look at that at your leisure. Where does that leave us? It leaves us yet again with the state of California uh, proposing new funding sources for education that are purported to solve the problem once and for all. Well, the once and for all piece is, is subject to a lot of debate, but we have two propositions on the ballot, Proposition 30 and 38. Th Proposition 30 was sponsored by Governor Brown and a number of different uh, education coalition members. Proposition 30 would provide funding uh, in an ongoing way that the state of California, this is really a kind of a key piece, the state of California has already determined and included this funding in its budget for education for the current year. So if Prop 30 fails, education funding will be decreased by about $900,000 here in Ross Valley. Um, in a $19 million budget, that's about a 5% funding reduction, which will be imposed immediately if Prop 30 does not pass. If Prop 38 passes, the competing measure, and I say competing because the two of them work in very different ways. It's frankly, there was a lot of uh, consternation about the idea that we had two propositions on the ballot, both trying to solve the same problem. They've become competing in many ways. Uh, Prop 38 would actually provide about $2 million of new revenue uh, to the schools, whereas Prop 30 as, I, uh, 30, 30, as I mentioned, would uh, allow us to keep our budgets whole to the tune of 900,000. So there's more funding at stake for Prop 38 than there is at 30. But the, then here comes the real the convolution. If both measures pass, only the highest vote will be implemented. Whatever measure gains the highest vote, either one must get 50% plus one. So if Proposition 30 passes, the governor's proposal, we would be held harmless. And by definition, if 30 passes, 38 cannot be implemented. So basically, our funding would be held, held harmless. If Prop 38 passed and 30 did not, then we would receive approximately $2 million that will be provided to our schools. And the district, at the district level, would be cut the 900,000 because Prop 30 did not pass. So there would be about a million, a little more than a million dollar funding increase to the schools if Prop 38 passed. If they both fail, we'll simply take a $900,000 funding reduction and, and we'll have to live with that. Prop 38 goes for 12 years, whereas Prop 30 lasts for five years. Both of them rely on new taxes, new income taxes exclusively for Prop 38. Prop 30 is a combination of sales and income tax. Um, so we are continuing with this level of uncertainty in school funding. Uh, we, of course, um, are hopeful the outcome will be a positive one for public education in November. And um, we just wanted to share with our community that these two measures that are on the ballot are, are competing in nature 
and have very different outcomes for us. And uh, well, I should say also, uh, the, the polling uh, is not going real well. Proposition 38, which would provide the larger dollar amount, uh, is polling about a 38 to 42 percent yes vote. That's not good at this late in the campaign. Uh, Proposition 30, the governor's proposals, polling better at 50 to 52 percent, but still uh, a lot of concern that neither one of those, we'd really like to see them in the upper 50s to lower 60s uh, going into the last month of the campaign, rather than having to sway voters to come to the, to the side. We'd like to be holding on to voters who've already said they would support it. So we're still at risk. There's still this uncertainty. Uh, and that's kind of the status. Um, very quick uh, summary of the presentation tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Questions from the council? A quick one. Perhaps I don't watch enough television, but I, I see ads for Prop 38. I have not seen a robust rollout of a campaign, and as you know, voting yes. will begin uh, quite shortly. Yes. Um, Prop 38 has hit the, the airwaves recently in the last week, I've noticed. Uh, Prop 30, what we hear is they are gearing up and they are ready to hit the airwaves as well. Uh, so we should be seeing something out there uh, in the near future. It's a little startling that they've both waited so long to run their campaigns. Um, we're frankly a little disappointed in that. Um, however, you know, I don't run such campaigns. I'm sure there's sound strategy behind that. Um, in fact, I have some idea that there is some sound strategy to that. But that's kind of what we're hearing. Other, Larry? Yeah. Um, is there any opposition to 30 or 38, uh, organized opposition? Um, I would say that the, the taxpayer associations generally line up against anything that's a tax increase. I haven't heard them coming out with any formal organized campaign per se, but I would expect to see that they would make some effort on some level. Beyond that, it's frankly, it's the two propositions that are against each other. They're not playing well in the sandbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe we need uh, Miss Honda's class to be a super pack or exactly. something like that. So. There you go. Absolutely. Yes. So, are you recommending a yes vote on both of them and hoping for the best, or what is your what is your recommendation, uh, or are you not allowed to make a recommendation of that kind? In... It's the latter. <laughs> we're not allowed to make a recommendation because we're prohibited from uh, promoting uh, ballot measures one way, for or against. Um, and I would leave that to your discussion about what you believe would be the right thing to do. Other questions from council? Can you say what you would personally do? Uh, <laughs> can I step out of my uh, CBO? Uh, yeah, at that point. We're just hoping for the best. And the best, obviously, is that something passes. That's about all I can say. Uh, we just, we're just hoping something passes. Okay, let's see if we have members of the public who have any questions or comments. Public? All right. Uh, seeing none, thank you very much You're for welcome. coming in. This is really helpful to hear. Thank you for much your appreciated. time. Much appreciated. I appreciate okay. it. You're welcome. Good evening. Okay. Moving on, uh, we are at open time for public expression. Three minute time limit per person. If you wish to address the council, please approach the podium now. State your name and address. Individuals have three minutes to speak. Five minutes if you're representing a group. This time is set aside for individuals wishing to address the council on matters that are not listed on the agenda. Um, and the state law provides that the council is not permitted to take action and strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be dis demonstrated to be of an emergency nature or the need to take an immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. Please state your name. Will you touch, hit the button on the bottom of the microphone so the microphone's on? Go my for name it. is Douglas Green, and uh, my issue is the uh, gasoline powered yard blowers that are used at my residence, which is the Bennett House, uh, up the road here, where there's a lot of elderly folks that live and they're uh, in serious uh, health issues like my breathing problems myself. Uh, my health and peace has been disturbed by the use of gasoline-powered yard blowers at my home, and every Wednesday morning just after 9 a.m., these loud machines are being used by earmuff-clad people stirring up dust into my apartment. I have a serious lung problems, and uh, myself, 
and I now require oxygen, so this gasoline burning fumes are also a problem. Uh, gasoline uh, problem uh, burning is also adding to our global warming in our planet, and the noise is also disturbing to our neighbors and the adjoining uh, elementary school. Uh, the dust is blown over the cars and paint and morning dew on the new windscreens, and uh, dust and debris is being blown on the two neighbors' property. Uh, global warming has made each uh, year the new hottest year on record in the USA. Uh, blowing our dust, uh, garbage, and leaves around and then breezes blowing them back doesn't make much sense when leaves could be gathered and composted. Noise is a mental health issue. Dust and gas fumes are also a health issue. Uh, many local marine communities no longer allow yard blowers. And I've heard that Ross, San Anselmo, Tiburon, Belvedere, Mill Valley are amongst them. I plea for the banning of their use where I live. And my name is Douglas Green, 53 Taylor Drive, apartment 324 in Fairfax. I have been uh, asking people to sign a petition which is, states that uh, this is a petition to ban the use of gasoline-powered yard blowers within their uh, associated noise, dust, and fume pollution and peace problems. Uh, so far, far, I have gained, uh, within the last few days in my spare time, I have gotten uh, more than 400 signatures on this uh, petition from local residents. Uh, and many of them are uh, my neighbors at the uh, Bennett House. And uh, that's the uh, issue that I have presenting before you now. And if I can, I will probably uh, allow you to deal with it further. If you have any questions, uh, fine. If not, I'll sit down once again. I, I have a question. You, your position on um, electric? Um... I, I, uh, my petition is to ban the use of gasoline-powered yard blowers. Uh, there are many alternatives. There is uh, electric battery powered. There's vacuums. There's a uh, break in a broom. And, uh, you know, there's many ways to de deal with this. There's composting issues. That, I mean, they're blowing away the topsoil and they're, you know, the uh, plants are not doing it quite as well as they could be if they just left the topsoil there. And the uh, resulting, uh, you know, the uh, protection from the leaves themselves on top of the soil, which decompose and uh, add to the uh, vitality of the soil. Okay, will you give the petition to our clerk? Oh, we got another Mayor. question. Go ahead. Um, we actually took this up a couple of years ago. So if you want to leave us a copy of the petition, you know, maybe it's time to take another look at it. We could take a look at the Ross ordinance and see what, what our sister jurisdictions are doing. You know, or San Anselmo too. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, we'll see. Maybe we can do something. Okay. Um, is there anything further that I can do that uh, would promote this? I think you've done a real good job so far. So. Well, I thank you very tuned, much. Okay. Is your contact yeah. information on the petition? What's that? Will you make sure that your name and phone number are on the petition? Okay, I will do that. I okay. have uh, uh, the petition right here and uh, all the signatures that I've gained. Mm -hmm. Some of them are out of the area, but the fact is that, uh, you know, I'm San Anselmo and Woodacre, sometimes they're on the petition. Mm -hmm. But I have gotten many more than, uh, and everybody seems to hate these things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, they're, you know, I've, I found it easy to collect signatures. Yes. I found that, uh, you know, more than 95% of the people that seem to want to sign mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can leave it with our, Ryan. Thank you. Um, I had a quick question for you. Uh, yes. Who who's actually doing this every day at nine or every Wednesday at nine o'clock? Is it the Bennett House uh, staff right, or right, their their right. contractor? The House, they have, hire a service that does this at, at our Bennett House. And how many people are, are our residents at the Bennett House? Seventy. And how many of the people? I mean, I find it astounding that you were able to get 400 signatures in a couple of days. I think that 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 speaks volumes to um, that it's a much bigger issue than what's just happening at the Bennett House. Right. Well, at, at the Bennett House, I have found that, uh, you know, 90 percent of the people there seem to be opposed to the use of the, and, uh, the noise. Did you bring this up to the, to the administration of the Bennett House? Yes, I have. They have not responded to my issue yet. 
and that's why I'm bringing it to the council. I do feel it would be advantageous to Fairfax to join the other communities in, in this issue, and including Santa Barbara and Los Angeles, oh, yeah. which I know have also banned them. Yeah, there's been some very um, big you know, arguments going on in these towns. This yeah, is not a new the, argument. You know, the spare of the air days uh, have added to the, uh, you know, importance of the issue here. Yeah, oh, well, thanks for bringing this up. That, that was very good. Thank you. Hold All on, right. we got one more. You have a question? Um, I guess it's not a question so much. I mean, I just mostly to say thank you. I mean, I've talked with this issue uh, on various different people in the, in the town. And I, I've gotten the same response as, you know, 90, 95%. And it seems like the people who like them are the employers of gardeners because right. it makes it fast. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, they, what they, more uh, need be said? They have many that? alternatives. Yeah. Better thank, for the environment. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. And just leave the petition with our minutes, okay, Clerk. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, Cindy? the button one more time is it on now yeah it's yeah. the it's on the light okay. on the microphone um, hi I'm Cindy Ross and I have two things that I wanted to discuss briefly you know during this open time but I do feel like something just came up that is honestly making me feel a little bit uncomfortable and, and a little bit shaky in fact and I feel like in the interest of you know I, I think it's really important for me to to bring it up um, Right before the meeting started, somebody approached me in what felt like was a pretty hostile manner. And without going into the specifics, said to me, but I think you're really wrong, about something that I had commented on at a previous meeting. And it is something that um, is on the agenda again tonight. And I was hoping to be able to add my comments in a civil manner. But honestly, right now, I'm feeling a little bit threatened. And I, I just want to make sure that people, I'm happy to talk about things civilly and, and you know openly and politely and, and all that. But I really didn't appreciate somebody coming up in what felt like a, an attacking manner. So I just wanted to say that to clear the air. Um, Anyway, the two things that I wanted to address, one's kind of a personal issue that I had a question about, and one is a little bit more broad issue. But, um, you know, as many of you know, I live in the vicinity of the Fairfax Plaza. And I received a notice um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was, about the testing or the air sampling, you know, because of the toxic, I think it's PCE or whatever, the, the dry cleaning chemical. And I guess I'm just wondering if there's any way that I could find out if I can get the air tested in and around my home. Um, because I know that I and my family members, but especially me, I've been pretty sick on and off for the last few years. And I have questioned whether we've been exposed to some of the toxic chemicals. And I'd like to see if there's some way that we can investigate that further. Um, anyway, the other thing that I wanted to, um, to bring up was um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I believe it was six years ago. I'll give you another it, minute. You'll give me another, okay. Make it quicker. Hit your mic again. There you go. Okay, is it on now? Yeah. Um, six years ago, this council, um, Larry Bragman was mayor, David Weinsoff was on the council, and I believe the rest of the, the members were, you know, were different members. But um, the Fairfax Town Council in 2006 unanimous, unanimously adopted Resolution 2466, which is a resolution of the Town Council of the Town of Fairfax calling for revision of the California Family Code and the Federal Violence Against Women Act. And in that resolution, the town council said that they were committed to working with people at all different levels of government and the community and supporting the National Organization for Women in um, discouraging and discontinuing the use of so-called parental alienation syndrome um, 
legal maneuvering to mishandle domestic violence and child abuse cases as custody disputes, and also to revise the family codes that were um, preventing proper adjudication, and reinserting language back into the Federal Violence Against Women Act that originally denounced use of these methodologies and identified them as violence against women, which endanger children. So I really want to applaud the council back then for you know, having adopted this historic resolution. However, unfortunately, very little has actually been done. And I think that, especially in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I would be more than happy to talk to any of you or anybody else that's interested and see if we can move forward with this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's Judy or um, who would address the testing. I believe the testing is being done by the private property owner and that it is, um, it's required by law to do the testing there for the purpose of we've done, the cleanup is done and we're making sure, that's my understanding, is we're making, assure, assuring that, the, that there's no longer any problem, is that? This was court mandated testing and uh, the property owner was the previous property owner and it took a while to get around to this testing. Um, and so there was testing done but there, um, the, the Department of Toxic Substances is the one who's doing this official testing this time. I, yeah. I've yeah. And the notice you got was pretty they explanatory. Put your. I've actually spoken to people from the state about it, and they they told me exactly what you did, or almost exactly, saying that it was a private party paying for it. Um, they told me that they would let me know, you know, if there was some way to find out if, if we could get it done more at a public level because, I, like I said, I'm really concerned. I don't know that, you know, the, these chemicals know the property lines and, you know, we're really right there. There are actually three houses that are right there as well as the properties that go into, you know, the Marin Town and Country Club. So, I, I don't know. I, I would just like to figure out a way because I, I know I have been told by somebody that has a business that wanted to move it into Fairfax and he had told me that he was prohibited by the state, you know, from even considering that location because they said, at least the way it was relayed to me, they did say that there were still toxic levels there and they didn't feel that it was safe to allow a new business to come in. So. I am really concerned, especially living right in that area, that there's still some toxic stuff going on. Right, and I think that so the test is will determine. You can talk to me, you know, at the office, and okay. maybe we can, I can share a little more information with you. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if Larry or David want to respond to follow up on the original resolution or actions that have been taken or? No, I mean, I thought uh, Senator Leno actually did introduce some legislation he didn't. Okay. Well, then we, then uh, then we can we can certainly I'm certainly available to follow up with you, and see what bills have stalled and what we can encourage. So I'd be happy to do that. Okay, Valerie. As many of you probably know, our presidential debates are no longer hosted by the League of Women Voters but instead by such luminaries as Anheuser Bush and other like-minded organizations. Thanks to Democracy Now!, you can see a more interesting version this year. In fact, you can watch it online when you get home, and I was listening to it before I came. They are uh, cutting in Jill Stein of the Green Party and Rocky Anderson, who is very funny, of the Justice Party, and you can watch it on Free Speech TV or Link TV. Um, you can listen to it in the archives on 94.1 or just go to uh, democracynow.org and watch it on your computer. It's pretty amazing. Um, the, only, the other thing I want to talk about real quick is uh, there's a damning new study entitled GMOs Cause Massive Overuse of Pesticides. Data sheds light on why pesticide companies lead opposition to Prop 37 and peer-reviewed by Chuck Burba, Burba, uh, Benbrook, PhD research professor at the Center for Sustaining Agriculture and Natural Resources at Washington State University, and it was released on October 2nd. It reveals that genetically engineered crops have increased pesticide use by hundreds of millions of pounds. 
The problem will intensify if the new round of GMO crops is approved, as Reuters reported today. Gary Ruskin stated, as we see from the data, GMOs are a fantastic boon for the, G for the pesticide industry. That's why the world's largest pesticide companies have spent nearly two, $20 million that we know of to defeat Proposition 37. Just one more little thing to talk about and think about, I guess. Um, there was one other thing I was trying to remember. I can't think of it. Thanks. Thank you very much. It, it's on the consent calendar, but you can you can say no, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. Next public comment. Hello, my name is Stephen Franks. I live at 19 Willow Avenue, Fairfax, and um, I would kind of like to know. I'd like to put it on the agenda. I'd like to know at what point did big business, Good Earth, um, dictate our local use permit laws? Um, what's happening down there is they. They came up here and presented a case that they were going to be good neighbors and be quiet, um, and that's far from the truth. Every morning, starting at about 3.30 a.m., they get deliveries, and there's no um, enforcement whatsoever on their use permit. Um, there's no, the police can't do anything about it, and it's just been crazy. You know, this morning at 5 o'clock, I'm down there taking pictures of all the trucks that are backed up. There's approximately 12 big rigs down there every morning before 6 a.m. They have a use permit right now that states that they can only have three deliveries before a certain time, and it's all in the use permit. They're not following that use permit at all, and uh, in one year, they renegotiate another use permit. If we don't have a use permit that works now, there is no use in renegotiating another use permit. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want, and that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have a meeting coming up, following up on the Good Earth piece? I know we had announced it last meeting and then I didn't hear about it again. No, that, that meeting was canceled. That was um, following up conversation with the um, owner of the restaurant and discussing the intent behind the meeting. It became clear that it was not going in the direction that they wanted to, to go. Um, and then I received an email from the owner of Good Earth indicating that based on our conversation that they wanted to cancel the meeting. So, but if I may follow up on this, we are um, required within the first year of operation to see how well the mitigation measures went for noise, okay? Um, and we will be doing that between now and January. <laughs> the um, permitting that the gentleman referred to is actually the construction of the project made a couple of changes in the field that were not as, uh, as presented on the plans. So rather than stop the project, put the whole thing on hold at great detriment to the owners, we gave them a conditional use permit for six months and then the following six months that will elapse in January for them, allowing them to come in after the fact and apply for the modifications to the things that were built not as planned. For example, there was some equipment on the back area f on the uh, Sir Francis Drake side that were not shown on the plans that went in. Um, the height of the fence that was built was higher than was on the plans. So they have to come in and after the fact get those revisions approved. So they have a use permit. They are now going to be coming in between now and January for a use permit modification to address those things that were built not as planned. Um, with regards to the complaint, we're all very much aware of these complaints. Um, the police have been out in the field at the times when there's been noise complaints um, by the gentleman. And also, Mark Lockerbie, who gets into town very early, tries to go by there to ascertain um, real time whether or not the number of allowed trucks, one large one between five and six, and two slightly smaller but large trucks between six and seven is being violated. On uh, our first inspections, there was no sign of violations. We have um, subsequent inspections found violations, so we contacted the owners of the market, and they're working with us to try to make sure that the trucking operators understand that there's restrictions on when they can come. Um, there seems to be like turnover in the business. A lot of these people that do the deliveries want to get in and out. It's, it gets to a question of um, how do you enforce these things, and it seems to me that um, this will be a forum for you to come back when we revisit the um, use permit modifications 
Uh, and at that point, you can make the case also in public forum in the Planning Commission. And then, depending on the outcome of that Planning Commission's determination to grant or not grant, you can actually appeal any decisions by the Planning Commission, bring it back up to the Council for discussion, and under an appeal situation, the Council has the purview to visit all issues relative to the use permit. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Jim. Um, so, there is a forum coming. We're very much aware of the complaints. Um, there's other issues out there like the, the backup noise um, that's somewhat related to the loading dock issue. These periods of noise don't go long enough to impact the noise, noise ordinance, but they're very annoying. So we might want to think about that in the context of this use permit and also following up in our noise ordinance, which will get more attention over time. Um, not just leaf blowers, but other aspects of it. So we might want to revisit the noise ordinance um, with regards to um, backup, things like that. So when is this meeting going to be held? There is no scheduled meeting at this point to address the three items that had previously been a mention of parking, noise, and circulation. There's no interest by the... So my neighbor on Willow can look forward to an endless series of days of, of not sleep, and that simply to me is unacceptable. Well, if you want to... No, I tried to do that. Yeah. I tried in setting up a meeting, and then it was, it was canceled. I know you're going, Council. Um, so th that, that was the frustration, was that at the community's mm -hmm. communication, along with the owners of the Good Earth, mm -hmm. I set up a meeting that then turned south for whatever reason, the license 41, whatever the reason was. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't relieve the problem of the folks on Willow and the Bell Avenue neighborhood who are being right. woken up every day. So were they right. supposed to sit around? You said there's going to be a review after the one-year period. That's January, February. So are they supposed to sit around for the next four or five months waiting for us to have a, a meeting? No. no, as I said, between now and January, the Good Earth will be required to come back in for those use permit modifications. And during that hearing, um, the gentleman will be able to make his case. And I think he would like to know, as we sit here the first week of October, when between now and December 31st, ballpark a month, uh, when we can expect Now that. you're asking me and when this will be showing up on the Planning Commission calendar. And okay. I cannot give you a specific date. I can only say it will be, be between now and January, January's meeting, which is the third, the third Thursday of every month is the Planning Commission date. Hey, you should so, go check out Mrs. Moreno. The two of you have a lot in common. So, okay. So, um, so that's, if, I could, okay. if I could just say... What? Um, it was the Good Earth that asked us to cancel that meeting. If you'd like to get together with the town manager and have the Good Earth come in and have a follow-up conversation on this, I'm at the mercy of your direction. Okay. Can I ask, um, what is the common practice if somebody is consistently violating a use permit? I mean, we've, I think we've, got, we've done the sort of first reign, which the first sort of approach is have a nice conversation. What is the, what is the second remedy after that doesn't, after, after violations continue? Well, we can revisit um, violations of a use permit. Um, we also have the administrative citation process. Um, and there's, there are way, we do have wherewithal to revisit the conditions, the use, the conditions of approval are being met or not. We can pull it back up. Ms. Mayor. Or, or you could revoke it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Uh, there's, uh, sorry, Jim. I, I was just adding, we, the permit could be revoked. Right. If necessary. Right. I want to caution you on another thing. This is not on the agenda. So exactly. So you really shouldn't be waiting any further than asking clarifying questions. Okay. And if you want to have a more of a, a council mm -hmm. uh, discussion, you should bring it back at the next meeting. And can I just add one thing for the record? In discussing the details of the proposed meeting by Councilman Weinsoff with the owner, uh, one of the partners of the Good Earth, it was um, not the original intent of the meeting, according to the owner, what was being proposed for the meeting that was then going to be under consideration. Um, Ryan, you had a comment uh, to yeah, make? A couple questions. Question? Uh, question. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I missed your name. Stephen Franks. Um, how often uh, is this happening? Uh, if you had to see. Six days a week, every day but Sunday. Okay, so six days a week, you're saying that there's a truck there at 3 o'clock? No, no, no. There's a truck there every morning starting at anywhere from 4 30. Please use your microphone, uh, turn your microphone back on so we can get you on the record. 
It's intermittent. Uh, the 3.30 noise is a.m. is intermittent. That truck, until the driver starts early, but there is no laws on him. Uh, what time they show up, they can show up any time they want. Most of the time it starts about 4.45, 4.30 in the morning and last. When Mark drives by to work at 6.30, 6.27 a.m., I said, how is it enforced? And Mark says, I look over my shoulder and look into the parking lot and count the trucks. I said, the funny thing is, is they've already come and gone because there is nobody else that will accept deliveries at that time in the morning. I work at a grocery store. I've worked at a grocery store for 30 years locally. We're not allowed to accept deliveries that early in the morning. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> yep. I feel you, brother. I'm, I'm I, right there. I, 10 I, months. I, I, 10 months. I want to have a couple questions because yep. I, I, although this may have been known to some, yep. I'm not aware that it's quite this bad. So oh, yeah. I'm interested in a couple questions. Yep. So if it's happening about every day, Yep. How many of these incidents are actually being documented with the town? That's my responsibility. I, I know of only a couple of instances where the building official has seen more than one truck on the site before the allowed time. And maybe the chief has more records. Um, and, and if you so instruct us, we will follow up with no, more. No, hold on. I really would like to cut this off. You guys are taking testimony that's factual in nature. If there is an enforcement action that comes up, it'll have to be done pursuant to a process, and the, the permit owner will have some rights to be present. So you should not be taking testimony now about evidence, about things that may come before you. If I was able to ask him how many of these have been documented, is that acceptable? That is evidence that should not be, you should not okay. be considering now outside of a, of a proper form. Thank you. Let's cut this off and, uh, and uh, hope that uh, <laughs> someone will bring it back super shortly. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. Judy, agendize it up for the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Our final public comment. Hi. <laughs> Is it still on or? Can I, okay. It's on. I'm Sophia Leahy. I live in 40 Willow Avenue in Fairfax. <laughs> and um, I've got one comment about the last person's, can't remember his name, terrible with names. But um, I back him up on that. There was this one time where I was going to school, it was about, 7.30, there are at least three or four trucks that were pulling out of the Good Earth parking lot at that time on the way to school. And they were loud, and they were big, and I don't know how that's legal in any way, but um, I'm just putting out another testimony to go along with whatever you already have. Um, so I want to be put on the agenda to propose a lighting ordinance to control light pollution in Fairfax. Um, proposing this would probably cut down a lot of um, not only the electric bills, but would allow more stars in the sky because obviously there aren't that many right now because a lot of lights are pointing upwards. They need to be pointing downwards. <laughs> There's no other way to explain that. Also, there is a lot of dangers with wildlife and other things that will probably be explained whenever I give the presentation. And thirdly, um, on the street, because I live on Willow, I have to bike to school every morning. And when you cross the street, you know, when the crosswalk thing goes off, um, the light that's turning out from Good Earth also goes on. And there's been plenty of instances where people have been turning right and I've always gotten hit by a car. So if you can try to get the um, stoplights working at a more timely manner, that would be great. So I don't have to keep worrying about getting hit by a car every time I cross the street. Yeah. So. Thank you. Will you um, get the email of Judy Anderson, who's, who is our interim town manager? I know you've got some paperwork on the um, the lighting project yeah. that you want to propose. So will you get some paperwork to Judy, and we'll see if a council member will will get you on the agenda for that. I've actually, we've met, we've met, okay, and yeah, she's yeah. given me the model ordinances. Oh, perfect. She has our contact information, and we're going to work with her. Great. to bring forward some what-ifs for you to examine regarding a light pollution ordinance. Excellent. And I, and I believe the timing on that intersection is also slated to be looked at. That, that is something new to me right now, and I don't have my head oh. around it, but I'll follow up and find okay. out what she's talking well, certainly, about. Certainly. I mean, maybe it, well, that was a Michael Rock thing, and we've... Are, is this where the no right turn on red was eliminated? Yes. Ah, thank you. That is for the Traffic and Safety Committee to revisit. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We have any other public comment? You already went. <laughs> I remembered. <laughs> very quickly. On quick, Saturday at um, the 6th, 
At 10 o'clock, um, we're gonna be leading a demonstration for Propos Proposition 37 across Golden Gate Bridge, thanks to Code Pink, who has uh, gotten us uh, to be allowed to do an unpermitted march. So we're allowed 50 or fewer people, and I could use another 20 or so. So thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, Please one thing, state your name for the record. Michael McIntosh. Um, one thing on the agenda, unless I just seem to have missed it, I thought we were also going to have a discussion tonight about the progress of the search for the town manager, and so I'm hoping that can be made tonight. That announcement went out. We had, the, we had that on last month's agenda. Michael, I was going to report on that as part of the town manager's report. Okay. On the agenda, I'll, I'll have a little bit to say about you that. You will have something yes. to say? Great. Um, second thing, I want to bring up the closed session and request um, from the council what the matter was about and remind the council if there was any written correspondence, then there, you're obliged to state what the subject matter was. So if I can ask that again. Jim. Um, I'll review the uh, record and uh, uh, the statute, and if there's anything to be disclosed, I will disclose it. Okay, and, and I very much appreciate that, and I know that last time you gave me a follow-up, but one of the reasons I like to ask in open time is because I'd like to just make the council not as opaque as sometimes it is so that the general public has the benefit of knowing how the town is conducting business. Well, that's why that's fine, this. and you have a right to certain documents, and you'll get them if there are such documents, but you don't have a right to uh, demand to know the, the subject of, of a closed session. Uh, un under the state law. I mean, if the t council wishes to disc disclose it, they can, but you don't generally have that right. Okay, well, please review that and follow it up also. And then third, but not you know, last, is my FOIA request, which I've been graciously working with Judy and she's been very helpful. Um, I believe there's some direction and some question about the Vaughn, ind excuse me, the Vaughn Index. And the Vaughn Index is a very specific guideline of what needs to be complied with as well as a 20-day statute of why something is not being complied with. And the town, again, is outside of those parameters of allowance, and I'm hoping that um, with council here, that council can agree to release information specifically about um, correspondence and billing to CSW and different specific requests that I have made to the town, and I have waited a very long time for them. Okay, and this is within the, the law and the purview of this council to make sure it does happen. So if you could please discuss that, it's not to be you know, an item for discussion, but there can certainly be follow-up and a question as to status as we've done earlier this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, council members have any questions on that? John Haley, uh, I'm here on the Good Earth as well. Uh, the uh, point being that uh, the city, in my feeling, uh, did not do its due, due diligence. Um, and the callous way that you that the city said to the gentleman, well, well, we're aware of the complaints. Well, if that was your neighborhood, there something would get done about it, wouldn't it? It's a fact of the matter. The trucks are there. Let's be. And if you know anything about the trucking industry, it's the farthest off 101 big store. So they're going to get their deliveries first, and they and, and then it goes out. Every working stiff in America knows that, and that's when they're getting delivered. So let's not try to play games or anything. That there is deliveries there. And it is in that gentleman's neighborhood, and it is affecting their neighborhood, and you guys didn't do your due diligence about it. The backing up horn, you are not going to disconnect. Let me tell you that right now, okay? Insurance and all that goes with it. So the gentleman has a point, and I would think that more than saying we're aware of the complaints, the city should say that's something we want to look into, and let's get some action on it rather than just chalant saying, now oh, you live there and I don't, and that's okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I believe we're putting it on the agenda for next month. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. We will move on to interviews and appointments. <laughs> Item number three. Judy, do you want to tee this one up? Yes, thank you, um, Mayor. We have a candidate for the general, general plan. Whoops. <laughs> Not the cat, no. Interview and appointment of a, of a candidate for the General Plan Implementation Committee. If you're having conversations other than those that are happening, please take them outside. And Cassidy, yeah. you want to come forward? Cassidy DeBaker is your candidate, the only candidate for this opening, and we're delighted she's here. Why don't you tell us why you would like to serve on the General Plan Implementation Committee? Well, now that I've done that, this is on the Okay. 
now that I have fin finally have time in my life, I just finished graduate school. My daughter's about three and a half, and um, I have the time, and I've always wanted to work on the general plan. I've, I've worked with general plans. I have a background in historic preservation, cultural resources management. I do work um, almost full time, but um, I've grown up here, I've lived here my entire life, so I feel like I could offer a lot. Any questions or comments from the council? You know, you will have to stay on this so long that you'll, this, this is a very long. <laughs> I know, I don't yeah. have a long line of people. Yeah. <laughs> <behind> <laughs> me. Um, it, it's very gracious of you to do this. Um, the, it took a long time under, um, you know, many planning directors, members of the council, John, to, to work creatively on this great document. And uh, it is a great, great challenge. So thank you very much for stepping forward. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. Okay, any other questions from council? Any comments or questions from the public? Then I'll move approval. We get a motion. Uh, Winesoff, second. And I'll second it. Read. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it carries. Thank you very much. And I look forward to working with you. Okay, we have another interview and appointment of a candidate to the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee for a full four year term. Judy? Okay. All right, this is another. Um, committee, the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee, and Tony Gardner, I believe, is here. And he's already been serving on this Affordable Housing Committee and is willing to continue. So we would ask that you interview him and um, consider him for a reappointment. Hi, Tony. Hey, will you hit your microphone and tell us why you'd like to be on the, stay on the committee? Well, um, I'd like to stay on the committee because I, you know, see the important need for housing for everyone in the community, um, including seniors and low-income workers, um, makes better community. So I, it's something that I can do. I have skills in the area of affordable housing. I love the idea of volunteering and helping the town, so that's a good place for me to do it. And I think we have some good projects moving forward. Mayor? Yes, Larry. Um, <clears throat> I've been working with Tony I guess, how long has it been? Three years now? Yeah, three years. Yeah. And, um, you know, he really does bring a lot to our conversations. And um, it's been a really interesting uh, time working on these projects, Lutheran Church and Olima. So um, he's a great resource, and we're lucky to have him on the town. And um, I, would, I would like to move approval of his nomination and open it up for other comments. But it's a very interesting committee and there actually are two projects that are in the works that are, are pretty exciting projects, mid-sized projects, and we are trying to do them homegrown style so they fit into the community or are not, you know, imposed on us by outside agencies. So it's a, a very interesting exercise. Great. Any counts? Other members? Ryan? Um, both for you, Tony, and Cassidy, the, there's nothing better in our community than volunteers because without the volunteers and putting the time in um, to make this town kind of what it is, there really isn't the same feel of the town. So, I mean, I'm really, I'm really, really stoked to have you guys wanting to do these things, not filling a void because it's there, but really having the desire and the drive to, to put in your time because that's really what makes Fairfax Fairfax. So, thank you very much. Other comments or questions from council members? Do you have any friends? Because I think we're missing. We're one short on this committee. I will look around. Good. Hold on, hold on. John, do you have a? Or you know, no? uh, let's see. Are there, are there any comments or questions from the public? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Uh, Larry has yeah. made the motion. Motion Bragman. Second. Second. Second read, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you so much. Okay, did somebody get a bib on that cat that walked through here? <laughs> all right, we are at council reports and comments. Uh, let's start with you, David. Sure. Um, I attended the uh, MCCMC uh, dinner at the, very sadly, the uh, uh, Terrapin Crossroads, um, very well um, attended by many council members uh, from across jurisdictions. We had an extremely interesting speaker talking about uh, the drug and alcohol uh, abuse uh, problem that particularly plagues our communities and 
plagued her in a very personal manner in the uh, way in which she um, has overcome that and started a, uh, a program uh, here in the county. Um, uh, fire board meeting uh, that went for a good three and a half hours to discuss some of the issues of uh, uh, that we're most concerned about that John raised about uh, individual responsibility for cleaning up uh, uh, brush and John can speak about that uh, later on. I also attended the Spirit of Marin luncheon which was really terrific. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is uh, from Chambers of Commerce from all across the uh, county um, promote uh, and identify uh, a worthy member and uh, of course in our case it, it, it was um, uh, Morgan, uh, who's, who's done such uh, great work uh, here, in, here in the town. Um, also with you, Pam, I was at that um, visioning, uh, choosing the future um, meeting, which I thought was particularly fascinating, um, not just for the local people, but um, the columnist from the Chronicle, John King, I believe the architecture critic, um, he said something that was fascinating that uh, as, as somebody who practices environmental law, I, I actually never thought about, which is I always think of environmentalism as immutable. It occurred when, um, you know, when Rachel Carson spoke and it has moved off that dime very, very little over the years and we've tried <laughs> to improve and to enunciate on, on her vision. But he, he actually raised the concept of the fact that uh, environmentalism actually is, is a mutable concept and, and changes over time with every generation. And he spoke about the fact, as we recall, that um, he, sp he called out Fairfax and Mill Valley's Hills and said the folks living up there, that'll probably always be like that. But it's very interesting about what might happen in the downtown with uh, a younger generation perhaps wanting to be um, more in their downtowns and how that will affect um, building pressures um, that communities perhaps have not entirely thought through in their housing elements. Um, and beyond that, just to, to mention uh, that I now serve on the board of the Environmental Action Committee of uh, West Marin and the uh, local coastal plan is, is up for reconsideration and I've been sitting in with meetings with the supervisors and the commission on that and although it's outside of Fairfax's borders, all of us are so uh, invested in, in our coast that uh, I'll take the liberty as time goes on to uh, apprise the council. John? Okay, um, let me see. Uh, I guess chronologically in order, I went to Safe Routes to School meeting where um, uh, there were, you know, various different issues around came up. Um, you know, a lot of it is centered around the new, ac new access to uh, White Hill Middle School, which has a new pathway that seems to be working out pretty well. Um, the um, uh, Meadowlands uh, group really didn't. bring up a whole lot at that meeting. They weren't really present, but there was, you know, some passed along information. Um, there's a lot happening up at White Hill School, a lot of construction, but also, you know, the, the new access and the bike spine is going to lead to that. Uh, we'll probably see some changes. Uh, there's also, you know, a request just to look out for pedestrians as you're turning right onto Glen Drive because that's a, a major crossing point that's a new traffic pattern. Uh, at the fire board that uh, uh, David mentioned, um, one of the items that ran that meeting so long um, was uh, an item that came up here, uh, 84 Pine. Basically, this is a property that technically is not owned by a bank, but was uh, the people who lived there, you know, lost it to the bank, and the bank hasn't officially taken title. And uh, we were apprised of some interesting legal um, situations where the, where the uh, fire department theoretically could try to put a lien on the place, clean up the fire hazards that are there and threatening the neighbors, uh, which many of the neighbors are upset about. Um, and uh, one thing that we learned is that the liens do not travel with a foreclosure thing, and perhaps council could weigh in on this, but that's what we heard at that meeting, um, which takes away a lot, you know, if, if they're not gonna get reimbursed for the cost of, of uh, doing that, then, you know, it may kick that back into our court in terms of what we want to do as a council in terms of nuisance abatement in that situation. Uh, perhaps at a agenda item for November. Um, I went to the GPIC com uh, meeting, this combination with the affordable housing meeting. Uh, there was talk at that meeting of combining those two committees just because some of the uh, objects um, were, um, concurrent and running along towards the same end. Uh, the, it was very interesting. It was pretty much 
focused all on affordable housing. Uh, and GPIC has uh, a number of things on its docket, but uh, that is one of them. Um, went to the town picnic. That was no cost to the town, but it was a lot of fun. I hope other people went there too. I know a lot of people in this room did. Um, and it's always a lot of fun. I went to a Fairbuck board meeting and also uh, got numerous little meetings about the chipper day thing coming up and I would encourage people to work with your neighbors and bring flammable stuff down to the pavilion parking lot. You bring it down on Sunday afternoon, next Sunday and the Sunday after, and it gets chipped the following Monday. And uh, it's a good opportunity to reduce fire danger around your house and your neighborhood. And uh, that's what I've got. Um, w I went to a meeting of the Marin Municipal Water District um, with the uh, innocuous name of a vegetation management plan. And uh, what that is about is the Mount Tam watershed is uh, somewhat being overrun by Scotch, French broom populations, uh, star thistle. They're basically invasive non-native plants that are slowly but inexorably taking over more and more space. And this has been an ongoing issue with the water district. What do we do? Do we cut it down? Do we leave it? Do we use pesticides? Do we pull it? And so this meeting was the beginning of a, a probably a long public process to discuss that. And this is going to be of, uh, I think, of great interest to this community, the Fairfax community, because we're sitting in a significant portion of the Mount Tam watershed, and it just so happens that our community is situated in the worst area of Scotch and French broom infestation in the entire watershed. And, um, you know, it seems like, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of, um, I would say, institutional uh, preference um, to use pesticides in the watershed. Um, mainly driven by uh, an idea that the short-term savings of using pesticides will promote the health of the watershed, which is something that I disagree with. And um, hopefully we can help, the community can help shape the, the process as it goes forward. It's just the beginning now, so it's now is the time to really be aware that this is being considered by the water district. And actually, there's an item on the agenda. It's the last item on the agenda, which is for our community to consider adopting what's called a noxious weed ordinance, which basically would put residents on notice that they are under an obligation to remove um, broom and other invasives from their property. And we would like to shape that in a way to not use pesticides to do it in a you know, basically manual labor or other processes so that we could be somewhat of a demonstration community to the, to the water district. Um, I attended a Board of Supervisors meeting last week. Board of Supervisors did uh, endorse Proposition 37 at that same meeting. Uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, decided to uh, end uh, the uh, Marin County uh, Health laboratory or to close the Marin County Health Laboratory, which is over on Grand, 4th and Grand. It's been there for 57 years. It's one of the leading health laboratories in the Bay Area, trains uh, other technicians. Um, again, financial constraints seem to have driven the decision to close that laboratory and outsource its services to Fairfield. Um, I pointed out to the Board of Supervisors that about a third of the testing that the public lab does is water testing. In other words, uh, various agencies will come in with water samples, whether it's beach water, creek water, that type of thing, to um, have the laboratory study it because, you know, we get, we get pathogens in our water supply and we need to warn people to stay, stay out of the beach, stay out of the creek, whatever. And those type of tests have to be done in a six-hour window. Right now, even though the testing is being done in Marin, it's very difficult for these agencies to get it done in the six hours. If you don't get it done within that window, 
your test values really are less meaningful. Um, so I will still be pursuing a conversation and lobbying um, with um, the Board of Supervisors to reconsider their decision. Um, and also, hopefully, we'll be talking to the Marin Healthcare District uh, because the healthcare district is going to be building a new hospital, and it seems to me that would be a great opportunity to do a joint venture with the county to put a lab in the new hospital. But um, a county of this size, this importance, I really think should be doing its own, uh, have its own health lab right here locally and not have to drive an hour to Fairfield. Attended the meeting with John on affordable housing. Um, and that's all I can remember right now. So I think that's about it. Thanks. Uh, well, for all of you who don't really know what the town council does other than these meetings, that's a good example of what all these people do. Um, I had a far less uh, load uh, this month. Um, the tree committee um, has a record low amount of applicants this time of year. Um, and that's basically because everybody is uh, enjoying the, the warm weather and not looking up into the trees because the storms haven't come. So usually the toughest months on the tree committee come uh, November, December, and January, and February in the middle of the storm season when no one's looked at their trees. So if you are watching this, go go check out your properties before the storms hit and uh, make it easy on, on our agenda. Um, uh, the Ross Valley School Board has been doing a great job of outreach lately, too. And I think the biggest problem that um, I was uh, walking into as the newest council member um, and listening to concerned parents and people um, that wanted to go to the meetings was how they felt there was a, a lack of, um, of uh, openness with the agendas, the proper postings, the proper um, things that were going to be discussed. And, and, and seeing as though San Anselmo kind of outweighs us two to one in the uh, in the volume of people category, um, Fairfax uh, was kind of feeling like they were being left out. Um, I, the new school board has been doing a tremendous job to post agendas, to get the outreach out there. I, on every one of their agendas, they discuss public outreach. They have listened to the people um, that, that wanted a lot of ideas and so that they could understand, hey, do I have to go to this meeting? Um, and it's, it's, it's really been working. And I've actually got a lot of uh, positive uh, um, feedback from individuals who told me the same thing. So it was not only my opinion, but it's it's clearly posted. Um, not as many emergency meetings were going on, and, and where people kind of had a red flag of, hey, why emergency? Why not? Um, so that's been going really really well. Um, my youth commission was supposed to have a meeting last week, but we couldn't get enough members to it. I think there's been a slight turnover in our youth commission. Um, I think we actually have a vacancy on our youth commission. Sophia, who brought up the uh, light ordinance, is one of my members on the commission too, and. Um, we, we have the funds, we have the ability to do some great things. We need a couple more members, but I think what happens, uh, they get back into the school year, they get a little traction, so I think the summer, um, and we're having a meeting next week. Um, we do plan to do another couple big events, and that's, that's exciting. Uh, I have been meeting with uh, Mark Lockerbie um, and trying to get the information out there in regard to the flood maps that are coming out. And there's a lot of issues. Um, I've also been speaking to a lot of individual homeowners that have a lot of questions about this, and again, I, um, it's not a formal meeting, but it's a, a, a grab to get information because we as council members are really going to have to get our hands around these answers to help out these people when they recognize that their uh, flood uh, insurance may be mandated and it may be significant. Um, so I've been trying to get my hands around the whole concept so that I can help share it with you and, um, and the citizens of the town. And uh, no major crimes task force oversight committee has been scheduled. Okay, uh, I was delighted to actually attend the car show that is held by the Rotary, and um, I actually was able, I was gave, presented an award um, to uh, Phil Soldavini, um, which I'm sort of um, in honor of he and his wife who passed away, who originated the car show. And one of the things that I learned that was really sweet was that they, that car show has raised $80,000 uh, for, for, for projects in our community, and that it's, a, it's a very much a, a rotary and volunteer effort and, and makes some really sweet things happen in our community. And it was a really nice opportunity to honor a really sweet family and, and make a lovely, lovely man cry, which is always <laughs> a terribly sweet thing. <laughs> Um, I also attended the joint meeting of the GPIC and affordable housing, and one of the topics that came up at that was the fact that there were three council members. If we do join those, if we do join those two committees, so we discussed the potential of me becoming an alternate on the affordable housing and having Larry be the kind of primary for that. Um, I played host to some 
uh, Cheetah Slow visitors, our Slow Town movement, our interna we're part of this international Slow Town movement, and we played host to some folks from Florida who were interested in having their town um, join and uh, wanted to kind of come see. We've, we've sort of been identified as the United States um, model um, because of all the work that has already really happened in our community um, and the amount uh, they loved. The, we had some folks from Sonoma Valley who had been here before who are also at Cheetah Slow Town and they loved the new mural for the repack and um, we had a really uh, just a lovely time kind of walking around our community and, and highlighting um, a lot of the work that we've done and, and talking about work that is left is, is yet to be done. Um, I also participated in the Fairfax picnic um, dunk tank service of the mayor. Um, attended a Chamber of Commerce um, meeting with uh, Judy and David Smedback, um, and the, the meeting that David uh, Weinsoff talked about choosing, choosing our future, which was interesting. I moderated a zero waste uh, panel, um, and I learned a delightful piece of news there uh, from Kim Scheibley, who is our Marin Sanitary Service rep kind of outreach representative. Um, San Rafael is currently uh, renegotiating their contract, and the model contract that they are starting their contract from is the Fairfax contract. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so that was a contract that Larry and I and Michael Rock and thankfully, thankfully Marin Sanitary Service was very patient on and we worked incredibly hard on it. And it's a very unique contract. It's on, there's nothing quite like it anywhere that we've seen. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see our kind of small town model where we can get a lot done and sort of push on edges because, oh, it's just uh, Fairfax, don't worry about it. Um, it's really nice to see that expand to a much, much larger uh, town, city. Um, and so, we're, and, and Marin Sanitary sort of mentioned that her their, their desire is to use Fairfax's contract as a model moving forward because all the towns and cities who are in their jurisdiction are sort of seeing seeing the services we're getting and of course saying we want that too. So that's a nice opportunity, it'd be nice to sort of move that. Um, I met with the f a couple of folks for the Streets for People to do a recap of that event and discuss uh, how and, and when we may uh, do it again. No, no real decisions were come to other than the fact that we felt like the event went really well and that we would like to, we would like to do it again in some way, shape or form. Um, and I also attended, miss, missed the MCCMC meeting to go to a CDBG meeting, which is the Community Development Block Grant Committee. And I've reported before that this, this commission has changed dramatically um, on the two and a half years that I've been on it. Um, it was sort of, uh, it's a meeting that has uh, representatives from every city in the town as well as a county supervisor um, and primarily was an opportunity for, I mean, our, our really good county staff would basically say this is the amount of money we have, this is where we think it should go, here are the applicants that we feel good about please approve them, and it was sort of a rubber stamp commission. And we took a lot of heat for it, actually, and, and we had some, uh, what was called the analysis of fair housing uh, pet impediments to the analysis, <laughs> I don't even know, a big report on why Marin is not uh, succeeding in, in offering fair housing to all of the members of our community. Um, and Marin County actually uh, took heat nationwide as being one of the communities that's, that's really not promoting diversity and really not always sort of uh, providing uh, fair housing uh, in our community for the people who work here and the people who, you know, are living, you know, want to live in our community. Um, and so, that commission has dramatically changed and we actually opened it up so that each sort of service area has recruited um, very specifically diverse people who work within the housing world in Marin County to be serving as commissioner, voting commissioner members on that, on that commission. And so it's upturned the apple cart a bit <laughs> um, and we've also, and it has created a number of subcommittees who have figured out um, who've been working really hard on figuring out ways we can really identify what those impediments are to fair housing and how the committee, how the community development block grant commission can make changes, can actually make changes. And a lot of that has to do with the, com the commission members and the committee members having much more impact on who are the applicants, how do we find the applicants, how do we review the applicants, you know, do, you know, and, and really bringing new applicants. And this, I think, bodes very well for uh, the, an affordable housing project that we have with our Peace Village because we're really looking for sort of new people to fund rather than sort of the same old, same old. And unfortunately, that's 
kind of freaking out, the same old, same old people who have been getting funding repeatedly over and over again from the community development block grants, and that will be something that the commission will really have to balance. But those interest, those, it is by far the most diverse commission I have seen um, in, in the county, and it's become very interesting and very active, so I've been enjoying um, that, uh, serving on that. And I think that is all that I have. Um, town manager report, Judy. Well, since Mr. McIntosh brought it up, I'll start with the, um, we're looking for a new town manager. Um, I think tonight the, the flyer that we're sending out will be on the website. It's been sent out to a list of people and the committee, um, the mayor and the vice mayor both sit on the committee with Michael Vivret, our finance director and myself. And uh, we wanted to start with a very focused local approach to finding a candidate. So we're going forward in that direction. And um, the deadline for applications at this point is October 31st. So if you know someone who wants to apply and would be a good person for our town, um, please send them my way. Um, I also went to MCCMC and to the um, Heart of Spirit of Marin uh, luncheon where Morgan Hall of our um, chamber was honored. And um, it's a pleasure to see these people who give so much to the community honored that way. It's a, it's a lovely annual event and it's up at St. Vincent's and you hear the stories of why these people were nominated and they give a great deal to the community. So I was appreciative of being able to attend that. So I think that's about it for my report. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our consent calendar. Um, do we have any comments or questions from the council on the consent calendar? Just, just to Judy, on the minutes of Monday, August 20th, mm -hmm. To take a look at that opening paragraph, um, we met, I think, in the morning that day, not in the evening. And also the... Oh, minor detail. Huh? <laughs> um, okay. And the second sentence could be jiggered a little bit. Uh, it was a little confusing yeah, to there's me. A little, yeah, okay. I see. So just a little, uh, a little tweaking. And just at the bottom, I, I want to call out the... Um, Resolution on the measure A, first of all, to uh, note that the heavy lifting here uh, was uh, mostly by our open space folks, uh, Mimi uh, Newton and, and Jack Judkins. So I, I would not want to take uh, too much uh, credit for, the hard, for their hard work and, and their dedicated interest here. But one of the things that I think people are focusing on as I talk to people around town is the question of acquisition, which is, of course is extremely important. But it, the, 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 one of the things I'm really focusing on in these tough economic times is the question of maintenance and the fact that it's also the maintenance of parks. And, and so um, should the um, citizens of Marin uh, be so uh, inclined and wise to support Measure A, uh, the town would come into funds that it could use toward maintenance. And I know that's been an issue that I've talked about for a long time uh, when a number of us so many years ago decided that would be um, a terrific idea, and it has been a terrific idea, to move the uh, farmer's market from uh, the concrete idiocy of the uh, parkade uh, to uh, the, the sylvan wonder of uh, uh, you know, of our parklands, are we have begun to love that park to death. And one of the things that I would love to see is if uh, this measure passes, we can begin to see how uh, to assist Rudy in his Herculean efforts um, to keep up the grass there. Um, he, he plants it, he reseeds it, um, but we really, um, really have to somewhat um, consider just, just to belabor this, a few years ago we did bring in somebody who, you know, deals with putting down turf at football fields and it is possible to grow a grass that is tough and if part of it um, suffers you pick it up and you move it out. Um, we are using that park so intensively that we really should think about how to grass it appropriately for, for its intended use um, and if this passes perhaps some of that funding uh, might find its way in that direction at the uh, discretion of, uh, of the town. Okay, any other comments or questions from council on the consent calendar? Just one, Mayor, just okay. one. On, um, on the um, minutes, I just want to uh, call out a correction on the minutes from September 5th 
um, where there's a comment on page two stating that the community video center should be folded into the educational component of the general plan. And that should be the community media center, um, the executive director of which is actually doing our technical <laughs> work tonight. So um, we want to definitely like recognize the community media center's work and um, thank them. So if you could just make that correction, that would be appreciated. Ms. Mayor, I also have a correction. Yes, uh, on the same minutes, Judy, on page three uh, on the council reports, um, it states that the tree committee did not meet and the Ross Valley School Board did not meet. That is not factual. I just had no report. Okay. okay. Any questions or comments from the public on the consent calendar? Um, Andy was blamed on it. Hi, Cindy again. Um, this is regarding item number nine, the adoption of resolution number 1265 regarding the uh, bike spine project. And um, I, I just have a question about it. I was discussing this with a friend of mine who lives on Shemron Court, and she's active with the Homeowners Association there. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here this evening for this meeting, but she had some serious concerns that I told her that I, I would bring up you know, on her behalf. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted a little bit of clarity though, because it says that this is adopting the resolution for release of the plans. Will there be any kind of um, process for you know, discussing further, or are these the plans that are, that are set in stone? Because I think that's gonna impact what, I'm, what, what I wanted to bring up. I mean, it's been on our agenda about five times, so I, I don't, I mean, okay. is this, I think we're All releasing right. them at this point. And okay, well, uh, let, let me, let me so just I think tell you what, what the concern is. Um, there, there were, it was twofold. One is that um, it's my understanding that part of that pathway was going to go onto Shemron Court because the, the sidewalk apparently nearby was too narrow or something like that. And um, my friend had expressed concern two things. One was that um, she said that the pathway that's, that goes from Shemron onto the White Hill field is actually private property and you know the, the residents there do pay taxes on that. And she was just a little bit concerned about this being you know part of like a town you know path or whatever through private property. But her bigger concern about it was that she was saying that there's really actually quite a traffic nightmare and parking nightmare. There are a lot of soccer moms and dads that come in there, you know, and they've discovered that that path cuts across onto the field. And she said that she is really, really concerned about, you know, kids being directed to, that that's the bike path. And I know I'm kind of reminded of a conversation I had earlier today with Larry Bragman, and it was a little bit different context. We were talking about crosswalks, and but he brought up the, the concept, and pardon me if I'm getting the terminology a little bit wrong, but the idea of liability for giving like a false sense of security. Um, you know, and that, you know, if, if you're making a modification for something that, you know, you have to be careful that you're not making people feel like they're safe when they're really not. And I guess that concern really does fit for me on that, is that here, you know, we're talking about marking a, bi a bike path and encouraging the kids to use it, but I'm really wondering whether that little strip that really is kind of overloaded, that has a lot of traffic, that has a lot of cars, that has a lot of people actually that really shouldn't be there, but that are blocking the path and stuff is really the safest place to have the, the bike spine go through. So I, I just you. wanted to raise that. Sure. Do you want to address the private property issue or, I don't know, John or Jim or I'm not sure who's the best? I can. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that pathway at the end of Shimran is in fact private property, but there is also an easement across that private property and it's been maintained as such, you know, since I believe at the outset of that housing development. And um, the safe routes bike spine that leads up pretty much to the start of Shemran has the pavement markings that lead it there 
to the sidewalk with the leads of the granite path. And that's, that's basically a lot of kids who are riding their bikes are going to, you know, vote with their handlebars and take that path because you don't have to bounce up a curb and over a whole bunch of tree roots and stuff like that. Kids that are walking um, are going to be aware pretty closely. I mean, kids figure that out really quickly, how, which is the shorter way to go. And in fact, it is shorter to go down Chemran and through that pedestrian oriented right of way. Um, so, um, you know, because that sidewalk is, you know, five feet wide, um, that was the choice that was made by our consultant to do that. Does that answer your well, yeah, I mean, it does answer the question, and like I said, I feel like I'm in an awkward position because, um, you know, it, I have my concerns. I'm not the resident there, but, you know, but I know that at least one of the neighbors there does have some serious concerns about it, and for whatever reason, I mean, I, I believe that they were involved in some of the meetings around this, but... I know she was very, very concerned that she couldn't make it to the meeting tonight, and I guess just wants to know that there's still going to be a venue for discussing this and discussing some of the residents' concerns about that. So that, that's all. I'm just relaying it for somebody else, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, it's frustrating to have that come up, you know, on the fifth hearing on it. Um, but, you know, that said, I mean, uh, it doesn't invalidate the concern. I mean, uh, and it's important to talk about it. And, and it did come up at the Homeowners Association meeting. Um, and there have been, you know, a number of people in that association contacted and people on Shimran um, who have been talked to about it. Um, you know, I mean, the, the parking for access to soccer games and stuff is another different issue, and I can see that that would be significantly, you know, something to deal with. I mean, it doesn't really relate to the bike spine as much as it just does to the fact that, you know, that's a neighborhood adjacent to a major playing field, um, which has much more limited access now on Glen Drive because of the construction at White Hill School, which is one of the reasons why kids are going there is because it is a lot safer for the kids. And really that, you know, for a lot of the people there, I mean, obviously it's, it's a balancing act between the various different interests, but the fact that the kids need a safe way to get to school is really the, the driving force behind this project and a whole lot of other things that are happening. Microphone. I, I certainly understand that, and of course, I, I hope you, I'm conveying that my concern is the safety of the kids. But I'm just questioning whether really having them go through what I, you know. I, I actually lived there for several months when when we had a fire at at our home on the other side of town, and I know what she's talking about from firsthand experience. That's it's a little cul-de-sac, and it gets quite congested. I'm not 100% sure that that's really the safest place for kids to be riding their bikes or, or walking, especially if, you know, if Glen Drive is, is a problem right now. So anyway, I'm just raising the issue. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Andy? And certainly pass along contact info. I'd like to know who she is and have her call me up. Andy Perry, Marin County Bicycle Coalition. I live at 10 Cypress Drive. Um, I wanted to comment on a few of these, actually. I wanted to um, first congratulate you on that um, amazing little tiny piece of sidewalk that finally got done. It's been a long time coming. I know there were some complexities there with uh, property ownership and utilities and stuff, so I'm happy to see that on the consent calendar and that there's a notice of completion on that. Um, regarding the uh, bike lane striping project, I'm happy to see the specs going out on that, and I assume that the Pacheco ones, the specs must have gone out on that last time around. Is that, I'm going to get a nod, and you're not supposed to comment, is that, is that correct? Specs went out on Pacheco P last time. P Pacheco P sidewalk. Pastori? Pastori. Yes. Pastori, my, my apologies. Yeah. Yes. So one of the things I wanted to urge regarding um, the uh, Sir Francis Drake bike lane striping project is Fairfax has a certain reputation up at the county for the amount of time that that project has taken. And I just really, like I last time I was here, I urged this, and I want to continue to urge 
that when the bids come in and as timely of a manner as possible to get that thing out to construction because uh, number 14 and 15 on your agenda tonight is about going out after OBAG funds. It is not pilot program funds, but it's still um, to the extent that these projects can get done, it's going to make Fairfax look a lot better and uh, for the uh, non-official qualifications, I think it will help uh, Fairfax perhaps get those uh, OBAG, one barrier grant funds. Um, and also for the bike spine pro project number 10, applaud that moving forward. Thank you for that. Um, and then finally, um, uh, for Measure A, um, I want to echo what um, uh, Council Member Weinsoff said. Uh, MCBC has been supporting that strongly. Some of those funds, in addition to coming to the towns and the open space, will come to some of the paved pathways around Marin. There's not any in Fairfax, although there may be. I don't know. Um, but th there's going to be a lot of benefits for the towns in addition to the open space area, and we support that fully, too, and have been working to help get that passed. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. Any other comments or uh, questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, I will close public comment and bring it back to the council. Uh, do we have an approval of the consent calendar? So a motion moved. To a motion, Weinsoff. Second. Second. O'Neill. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries on the consent calendar. Um, how do people feel about taking a break now before going on to our public hearing or hitting our public hearing before we take a break? Break? Break now. Thank you. Uh, Ten minutes, really. Okay, let's get started back here with our public hearing uh, regarding 150 Bolinas Road, an appeal of the Planning Commission, approval for a use permit modification to allow 7-Eleven to remain open 24 hours a day. Uh, and this is Planning Department. I'm going to tee this one up for us. This is, I think. Okay. You all are well-versed in the background on this. This is the third time it's come before you. <clears throat> The staff report is very succinct again tonight <clears throat> and in the attachments you will find the staff report from the prior meetings <clears throat> where it was very thoroughly laid out to you to the issues and the attachments were included including the um, signatures in favor of having it open and we attached a uh, the minutes from the July 11th meeting also and finally under exhibit D the petition was presented to you by the appellant at the last meeting. Um, would you like me to briefly go through the staff report? No, okay. After the meeting, when you asked me to once again see if there was any <clears throat> way to deal with this, I met with the owner of the 7-Eleven, and to my great surprise, he offered to pay for the sound wall. So our recommendation tonight, staff's recommendation, staff doesn't make the decision, you all do, we just recommend. Our recommendation tonight is to deny the appeal and add a condition of approval that would require the 7-Eleven to build the sound wall as described uh, in the staff report on the property line, basically at the outline of the existing wood fence and then the trellis fence at the front face of her building going aft, or sorry, going back. Um, and then they also, subsequent to the writing of the staff report, the 7-Eleven would actually like to take that sound wall where it bumps up to eight feet all the way back to the back of the property lines where they adjoin. Um, so that would be the staff report. Uh, well, we do recommend, however, that um, depending on how you rule tonight, that um, you give us some time to go back and make the required findings for how you um, decide to go on this. Uh, do or or to thank pre you, prepare Jim. findings for your consideration at the next meeting. You, you can direct us which way you want to go, and then we'll prepare findings for you to adapt at the next meeting. Okay. Um, let's bring this up to the council members uh, for comments and questions. Are, is, is there the? I know we got a letter from the appellant. Um, I don't know what. Yeah, we you may want to open the public that. hearing and have the appellant come forward and present what they would like to say tonight okay. and then allow the owner to speak and then go to council and then the public. Okay. Why don't we get the appellant to come up and state their response to this paying for this sound wall. You should clarify that you're opening the public hearing. Opening the public hearing for Sorry. our appellant. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the council and staff. My name is Riley Hurd. I'm here this evening on behalf of the Morenos. 
um, who you already know lived directly next door to the 7-Eleven. Um, they've actually lived next door for 22 years, so um, the fact that there's a 7-Eleven there is not a surprise. Um, for the first 17 of those years, the store was open from 7 to 11. Um, then in 2007, the hours changed, 6 a.m. to midnight. And uh, they felt the impacts of this change because the additional hours were one early morning and one late at night. It was very noticeable. So now, as you know, the 7-Eleven wants six more hours, all in, 24 hours a day. And these six hours, besides being the Moreno's only quiet time, are the most sensitive time of day. They both work, and they both, like all of us, need their sleep. So the mechanism by which 7-Eleven seeks this additional entitlement is a CUP. And your code has a very specific test. That's, that's what uh, we lawyers do is go right to the law and say, what does it say? And um, given the importance of this test in your decision this evening, I would like to read it uh, verbatim. It's not too long, and it is a finding that you must make in order to grant the permit. Here's the finding. The development and use of the property as approved under the use permit shall not create a public nuisance, cause excessive or unreasonable detriment to adjoining properties or premises, or cause adverse physical or economic effects thereto, or create undue or excessive burdens in the use and enjoyment thereof, any or all of which effects are substantially beyond that which might occur without approval or issuance of the permit. So clearly a sentence written by an attorney, but uh, I think it's helpful in guiding your decision. And I'd like to state the finding a little differently. If allowing 7-Eleven to be open all night results in an unreasonable impairment of the Moreno's quiet enjoyment, remember their property is the adjoining property, or makes the home worthless, then this permit may not be approved. That's directly out of Fairfax's town code. So I would submit to the council that that's exactly what's going to happen if they're up and open all night. But we do not need to speculate or guess because the Planning Commission has already given 7-Eleven two temporary six-month trial periods, as you're aware. And each of these trials concluded with more conditions being imposed on the operation of the business because it was clear that the late-night operations were negatively affecting the Morenos. So noise is one of the serious problems, and um, I'd like to address the sound wall. But first, you should know that the Morenos have routinely been unable to sleep at night. Um, it's loud. They can hear the patrons and things going on over there, but noise isn't the only issue. Um, there is a certain type of customer that often, though not always, frequents a 7-Eleven between midnight and 6 a.m. And these customers, besides being loud, uh, have had a lot of other detrimental effects. Um, and I'll give you two specific examples. Number one, multiple times people have been seen coming from the 7-Eleven, going around the newly erected fence, and urinating in the Moreno's front yard more than once. And because of the noise, uh, Misty or Pedro, Peter, have been up and observed that exactly where this person's, co person's coming from. Secondly, there's been a huge increase in trash, specifically food wrappers, that comes from the late night hours. Uh, and again, these are things that are observed because they're being kept up. So I think to say that that's a detriment is a gross understatement. It's a pretty clear case of an impaired enjoyment of a property. And that case is made even clearer when you speak to Mr. Moreno when he wakes up in the morning after an interrupted night of sleep and is trying to go to work at the county of Marin. It's pretty difficult. So my point is the testimony you have and the record, which I reviewed carefully, uh, makes it clear that the finding that you have to make, it can't be made. And that's very important. I want to talk about 
very briefly the economics of this decision because it, it did come up at the planning commission level a seven eleven representative stated that they expect between fifteen and twenty customers between midnight and six a m so even if you assume a ten dollar per transaction average mind you i read a report online from a field consultant for seven eleven that says about four dollars and ten cents but let's just use ten dollars we're talking about 150 to 200 bucks. Take out six hours of employee salary and six hours of operating costs. Now we're talking about $60. So either the estimate is grossly inaccurate and there will be a lot more visits, i.e. more impactful, or it's a business decision that doesn't make sense. But if the statement is correct, I would hope that this council values the enjoyment of their property at a level higher than $60. I did uh, read a lot of discussion about the community benefit. Is there one, is there not one of a 7-Eleven being open all night? Um, the idea of the late night milk run. We've all been there. Uh, and finding D of the CUP analysis is another one that comes after the one I read, uh, does require that any use you approve be in the public interest and for the enhancement of the community. So it is something you're supposed to be looking at. And, but this, this is a really important part from a legal perspective. It's a conjunctive test. You must make every single finding. And because the impact prong cannot be met, it cannot be approved. Furthermore, there's a 24-hour 7-Eleven precisely two minutes away, according to Google Maps. So you can still get that milk anytime, two minutes. Before concluding, I would like to address the sound wall because I know that staff was uh, pleased that 7-Eleven stepped up and said, hey, we'll pay for this. And um, I think that that's a good start. And given that this is a commercial use directly abutting a residential one, which is somewhat rare, usually there's transitional zoning in between those two uses, um, it's probably something that should have been required a long time ago. But the problem is, uh, it won't solve most of the problem. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first is the origin of the noise is not just from areas that will be behind the wall. Because the 7-Eleven is open, it draws people. You've already heard they're coming into their yard, dropping garbage, doing other things that are worse than garbage, and uh, sound wall doesn't affect that. Second, the Moreno's bedroom window is 10 feet off the ground at its midpoint. Uh, a six-foot wall does not help a 10-foot master bedroom window, and it directly faces the 7-Eleven. But really, it, it's more about the fact that it's not just about noise. A wall won't capture all the noise. It might get some, but it's really about these are the hours they need a break. It's the six hours they have to sleep. They've, these hours have already been eroded by the 2007 extension, and at this point, they just can't take it anymore. So I think the decision, when you review the record in its entirety and through the lens of the code section you're supposed to be using, is a very straightforward one. Um, we have direct and credible testimony that an essential finding, one that must be made, cannot be made. Accordingly, we ask you to grant the appeal and not issue the CUP. Uh, at this point, very briefly, Mrs. Moreno would like to make a few comments, and we'd like to reserve uh, a little bit of time to address any public comment that may occur. Thank you. Thank you. Hit the ball one more time. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, I can't believe I'm still here yet again. Um, it's become rare that we can sleep through the night without interruptions, which happen a minimum of three times a week now. Um, the urinating in my yard happened twice in the last week. Uh, yeah, it's too well lit on 7-Eleven, so they need the shadow. They go to the other side of the fence. Um, it makes it really difficult for us to work. My husband has a high pressure job at the county. I'm a teacher. September and October can be tough months 
We get the kids settled into their new routines in September, and all our DRDPs are due by October 1st. It's been really intense getting rest and getting work done and being able to do my job. Uh, the garbage has increased. The noise has increased. Uh, there are still idlings in the morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. There's a regular school bus that sits there and drinks his coffee with the idling on the side. In the front, we still hear it. I'm questioned since the refrigeration was done over, I think, eight, nine months ago, maybe 10 months ago. The noise from the generator, I think, is facing us, because that's always been questionably loud. I was trying not to nitpick and didn't bring that up. But I come, keep coming back to the point of what a nice convenience this is for irregular needs, not on a regular nightly basis that somebody needs to be shopping. And balance that against the extreme inconvenience this is creating in our lives. We bought that property 22 years ago. The name, the brand, the hours were known. I've never argued with that. I didn't even argue at the six to midnight. But this is, I think it's unconscionable if you give this permit. You're throwing us to the wind and all that we've done here. We took a hundred year old cottage and turned it into a home. We did put in double pane windows, as you suggested, and insulated walls. We've put a lot of money into that house. We still have a mortgage on it. And to put this convenience issue ahead of us and ahead of how much more it is going to cost us. I've pleaded, I've implored, and I've begged for you to consider this and consider our needs. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have uh, 7-Eleven representatives come up? Hi, Raj Apple from 150 Bellinis Road. And we, like Mr. Jim said, we have agreed to put up a sun wall and all the way across through her property. And, and that's about it. And second of all, I wanted to uh, uh, say something about the urinating. We do uh, have a public restroom, which we let people use all the time. It gets used a lot, so I don't know where this is coming from that they're going to the other side of the fence to urinate and we haven't seen that on our cameras anybody going back there or anything i don't know where this is coming from all right thank you um let me bring it to council members all the way in for the third meeting in a row you want to talk oh, so, uh, yeah sorry i is it Do you want to go to public first to or have council why don't, we go to the, why don't we go to the public first? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Can you um, hit your microphone there? Um, no, on the base of the microphone. There you go. John Hanley, 152 Olima. Um, I'm here in uh, defense of uh, uh, Missy and, and uh, not to let them stay open uh, past... Uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, I'm a veteran when we uh, said the Pledge of Allegiance is justice for all. When their family bought that home 80 years ago, there probably wasn't a 7-Eleven there. When she bought it again from her grandfather, the 7-Eleven was closed at, mid at 11. Justice for all. Uh, it's now, they're, they're bringing it to Fairfax. This is a Fairfax issue. Fairfax Town Council is listening to this and go, my God, you're right. Right? I'm getting your name. It's a very nice guy. But in his business plan, his business plan, when you buy that property, you know it's closed at 11 or 12. To ask for to, to additional hours, and then, then that's asking for money, more money, which is okay, that's America. But his business plan was at, at 11 o'clock. Now, there must be, the, the, the attorney brought up the fact that they're making 8 or 10 bucks an hour. Well, that, they're putting up an 80 foot, eight foot attaining roll. What's that? 50, 60 feet that you guys uh, advertised. Union labor. We're talking 40, 50 thousand dollars. So there must be some, a lot of money coming in. Um, they're nice people that own that store, but these are Fairfax residents, and it's about fairness. 
and it's about Fairfax. And, you know, I've got three kids. Of course I need a quart of milk every couple of years. You know, it's not that big a deal, guys. Uh, there's earthquakes. We live through these things. Um, but I'm asking the council to think about uh, the kindness that the Fairfax Council has always had and supporting the neighbors and, and supporting the community. These poor people on this block, I, and uh, by the grace of God, they got AA meetings here starting at 7 o'clock every single day. 365, starting at 7, which means the guy's got to be here at 6 to get the coffee moving. So this block has movement going all the time. So let's be kind to them. And, and, and the poor guys with the store, hey, you know what? Your business plan, it was at 12, and you want to go to 6. That's not fair. That's really not fair, town council. It's, and, and, and if Missy's bringing it to you, it bothers her. You, double pane windows, you can't, the, the windows are open now. A sound wall is not going to do it. And it's going to cost a lot of dough if it's done right. Uh, and let's talk about uh, the, uh, it brings, this is not a library people are going to at midnight. These are, there are some people there that have had a couple. And, and a police officer might want, not want to say it, but I'll tell you. I got 30 years in that type of service. And you're bringing people in there that aren't the greatest guys in the world. And they're going to get a little goofy every now and then. That's normal. I mean, they're out at 2 in the morning. They're out at 1. You're not going to sell booze, but they're going to get a burrito. Come on, let's be truthful. So now let's be honest with, you, with, you, with ourselves here. It's not fair to this woman. It's really not fair. And vote to uh, please keep it, shut it down at noon. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cindy? You were already on. <laughs> okay. Am I on again now? Yeah. I, for some reason, I have a hard time with this. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, I, you know, I feel like I'm in a very awkward position here because far be it for me, you know, I feel like there are some people in town that already think I'm public enemy number one. And, you know, so be it. I, you know, I, I don't want to alienate anybody any further. I don't want to have any disputes with, you know, with homeowners or residents or neighbors or anything like that. But I do have to say that I'm a little bit offended at some of what I've heard. I mean, I wouldn't say that I frequently go to 7-Eleven in the middle of the night, but there has been more than, you know, a few occasions where I've really, really enjoyed the convenience of, of being able to go late at night, whether it's to get, you know, milk or Tylenol or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, this is the first that I'm hearing about urination, you know. I certainly don't urinate where I'm not supposed to. And, you know, I, I really feel like if that's an issue, well, then, you know, we have our police chief sitting here. The police station is right across the street. The fire department is right across the street. I mean, I feel like is it really 7-Eleven's fault if somebody does show up that's drunk or somebody does choose to go urinate on the fence? I mean, that's something that that they'd probably do it anyway, you know? And I, I guess I'm just, I, I don't mean to be insensitive to somebody that, um, you know, that is having some concerns about sleep and, and noise, but I've been to several meetings where this has been discussed, and I've heard that the noise of skateboards is a problem. Now I'm hearing that urination is a problem. I'm hearing that there's this terrible noise in the middle of the night, and it seems to me that 99% of the noise is not coming from, or it's not 7-Eleven's fault. If there is a problem with people that are drunk or rowdy or disruptive or break, violating noise codes, well then, yes, I think our police and law enforcement should do something about it. But I don't know that it's necessarily 7-Eleven's fault. And, you know, and I'm no lawyer. But when I hear about, you know, devalued property and stuff like that, well, the property is only going to be, you know, of value if you're selling it. But if you're talking about living here, that, to me, that just doesn't seem to make sense. So, you know, as an audiologist, which is what I do by profession, 
Um, you know, I would seriously recommend getting some really good earplugs and seeing if that can, you know, can add to, you know, the, the comfort. But I, I really don't see the issue of 7-Eleven, you know, I don't see them directly responsible for this. So, and as somebody that really, really enjoys having the convenience of having that store open, I would appreciate if, if you would allow them to do it. Thank so, you. Thank you. Valerie? Um, what I've noticed over living here for the last uh, almost 30 years, I guess, between San Anselmo and Fairfax is the noise levels going up every year, t traffic, number of people, and I think it all does begin to wear on you. And I, I kind of sympathize with these neighbors, I have to say. I live on the creek. Uh, a lot of homeless people like to use the creek. A lot of kids like to go down and drink. And um, there is a lot of urination in the creek, and there's a lot of um, other stuff that goes on down there, too. And um, it is really aggravating when you're trying to sleep. And um, I would think between the noise, and I, I'm sure it's true that this, the 7-Eleven is just an additional thing to everything else that's going on, but you do kind of hit the wall at a certain point. And I really get that, and I think that really does need to be considered because we're getting we're getting too dense and you can feel it. You can see how uptight people are getting. You can see a lot of, of the impacts of things that are going on. And I think they've made some really reasonable arguments to my mind. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Lark Tittle and I work for 7-Eleven. I'm not a lawyer. Um, we didn't bring a lawyer with us tonight. I didn't think that was necessary. Um, I'm here just to speak to what I know of that has happened in the last year. Um, Raj worked very hard to get a store to be open all night. He did it to help Fairfax, not, as you can see by what they've talked about, it's not that he's making a whole lot more money, but we thought 10, 15 more people would come in between midnight and 6. We're up to about 40 or so between that time. It's 40 people in your community that need us. There is another 7-Eleven two minutes away, but they've chosen to come to this 7-Eleven. It's no other reason than your community has chosen it. We're not bringing people from the 101 out to here to get it. It's not people that are coming from Point Reyes to come here. It's people that live here in your community and about 40 a night from midnight until 6 in the morning. So you're affecting a large part of your community if you decide not to let us stay open. And we have worked very hard. First, I was told it was because of lights that came in the bedroom window. So we put up a fence recently. It wasn't tall enough. We made sure it was tall enough, and then we were told it wasn't tall enough. Then we've been told, no, it was noise. Now we're being told it's urination and all these other things. And I feel like it's become personal. It's us against them, and, and that's not a good thing. It's really about your community. And your community needs us, or they wouldn't come in. So that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Is there other public comment before the appellant comes back up? Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, I would just suggest that you focus on the code because it really spells out the test for you. And um, the typical political decision is balancing tests and what does the community want and what does the applicant want and what do the neighbors want? But here the code is different for a CUP. It says, look at the adjacent property. Are they or will they be negatively impacted? Um, I don't think we're saying that the 7-Eleven causes people to go urinate or to do any of these rowdy things. Um, but the fact that they're open causes those people to be there. So yes, it's a busy area. They're across from the fire station. People are walking back from the bars. Uh, you got the AA meetings that start at six. We're simply saying, just give them a six hour respite, a quiet time when they can sleep. And I think if you read the code, uh, the decision is very clear, particularly uh, now that we hear that the estimate is twice what it was at the planning commission level. So. Please grant the appeal. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll bring it back to the council. David? Yes, for the third meeting in a row, I will support strongly the appeal in this matter. Um, it, it is simply unconscionable. I have read the staff report for the third time uh, in all of its variations, and all I can think of was, well, I think Ms. Moreno brought it well. You, you shouldn't have had to go to the expense to bring able counsel with you. I thought that your comments the last two times you were here struck the point, although you didn't also raise the point about your refinancing issue and the diminution that may or may not occur as a result of the 7-Eleven. What got to me at the core of this thing is you move into a place, so you go to look at your house, and you say, well, there's a 7-Eleven in there. They're open from 7 to 11, and you make the economic, the personal decision, the judgment that, hey, I can put up with that. Um, and then all of a sudden it goes from being 7-Eleven over time to where it is now, 24-7. Um, that's simply not acceptable. Now, if the chief came to us and said to the council, you know, I really have to put a substation in here, it's public health, it's public safety, we would not be having this conversation. Um, in fact, if 7-Eleven was providing some sort of other sort of Im important uh, public service, I would say great. But the fact is that whether it's two minutes by Google, whether it's five or six or ten minutes by bicycle, um, there's another one just down the block in a non-residential area that provides the same sort of important service that you do. To me, I can only imagine what would I be doing if I lived in your house now? What would I be looking at? I know we had this conversation last time, but the, if I was sitting there and looking at my council and saying, my heavens, you know, I want to sleep at night. I want to have a couple hours of sleep here. I want you to treat me fairly. Would any of us be arguing the point of 7-Eleven as opposed to Ms. Moreno? I just can't believe that any council member that I've ever seen in all the years that I've been here would ever argue in favor of the position of keeping that building open 24-7 when the deleterious impacts that Ms. Moreno has expressed and that her council has put down more formally in writing um, occur. This is not a close call for me in the least and when we come to a vote and I do hope we put put this to rest three meetings in uh, I will be voting to uphold Ms. Moreno's appeal. Thank you. John? Okay. Um, I mean at, at this particular meeting we've heard this appeal um, and a number of arguments um, and in past meetings, we heard about a petition signed by 650 members of the community who said, this is important. We heard a lot of people stand up and say, I mean, Cindy talked tonight on how it was important to her to have the convenience of a thing. I mean, it may be two minutes by Google Maps, but that's driving a car. And sure, if you're driving a car anyway, it's, it's no big deal to go down there. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a mile or maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, walking at night. And we live in a walkable town, and this is walkable to downtown. Um, also, in past meetings, we've heard uh, the chief of police say that actually the noise complaints and things went down when the 7-Eleven was open. Um, So that are, those arguments are on the other side. I mean, I've talked to a number of people in the community about this, and the word earplugs has come up by half a dozen times at least. Um, but at the same time, it is a quality of life issue, and it's difficult to balance that out. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to live next to 7-Eleven either. Um, I basically, I, I went down and stood there at 11 at night. I didn't want to go down at 2 in the morning because I generally not up at 2 in the morning. But, oh, I'm up, but I'm at home. Um, and the loudest thing that I heard was the, the compressors running to run all the coolers in 7-Eleven. Any commercial building is going to have those compressors running. And I thought that that would drive me nuts. Um, well, whether they're open or not, those compressors are going to be running. And, um, and I asked about the sound wall last month, um, what opinion there was, and I heard 
you know, about, about whether the sound wall could help the, the sound. And um, the response that I got was like, they should close, you know, and, and, and sure. I mean, there's, there's one solution that is looked at as the, the thing that will fix everything. I am not convinced that having the 7-Eleven close is really going to make it that much quieter there. Um, at the same time, I can see that it's a very emotional issue and it's, uh, you know, how can I deny somebody sleep? Um, so it's a very difficult decision. And uh, unlike my colleague, Mr. Weinsoff, I'm, I'm not going to be going, oh, this is the way I'm going to vote one way or the other. I'm, I'm distraught over this. I mean, it's a difficult, the, our job, it is a, yes, a political decision to balance out the different needs of different members in the community, and, which is difficult to do sometimes. And this is, you try to look for a win-win situation, and I was hoping that with the sound wall, we could come up with a solution where the needs of the community and the needs of the immediate neighbors could be rectified so that we could find some place in the middle where everybody could live with it. Um, it's a difficult, I'd like to hear from my other council Ms. members. Ms. Mayor, I have, uh, okay, I Brian. I have some questions. Um, so uh, for a 7-Eleven representative, if someone wants to come up here, I have a few questions for you. As many of you know, I've been really uh, taking a lot of time to, to dig on this issue. It is an important issue for the town. and. Um, and there are a lot of things that have been addressed. Uh, all the uh, all the uh, concerns that that the attorney has brought up, I have already thought through, which which made me believe that I've I've done my homework on this project. And um, to every one of their points, I kind of know both sides of where his points are coming from and where Misty points are coming from. And I also have a counter argument to them that can easily be posed, which which tells me that that I that I have encompassed this concept, um, and I still don't have all the answers, but I do have a, a couple important questions. Number one, um, you currently do not sell alcohol between 12 and 2 by your choice, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. If you were to make an estimate, how much business are you, uh, how much business do you estimate your alcohol sales would be if you did sell alcohol between 12 and 2, as the law would allow you to do? Uh, I don't know. I, I, Honestly, I would not know. Can we compare sales of alcohol to the 7-Eleven down the road from 12 to 2? Maybe $100. $100 in alcohol? Yeah. Is that... Say between $100 and $200 in those two hours. Okay. And then how much would you estimate your business is, do, is doing now? Um, and I remember his point was there were 15 customers when, when we took this up at the planning commission level, and now you're at 40 customers a night. And I can only assume that that's because now people recognize you're a service that is now open, and therefore, are you seeing constant increasing um, people using that? I mean, uh, what we uh, seen is it, it has uh, all the. We have a lot of the regular customers that come in every night to get their coffee or on their way to work or get uh, any uh, stuff like that, and it's pretty much it had stayed at about 40 to 50 customers at night, and it has not increased or decreased. Okay, and. He, so, the attorney and 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 people who are on both sides of this bring up one point that I have not yet been able to answer, and that frustrates me because I like to know the answers, and when it doesn't make sense to me, I have to keep asking questions. And the only thing that I can consider, if you are choosing not to sell alcohol between 12 and 2, that would be a a poor business decision, if I, from a business perspective, I would I would assume, and that if you don't have a ton of customers spending a lot of money between those hours, um, again, I would assume that keeping the business hours open would be another poor business decision, um, from from the layman's business perspective. So, why? Okay, and, and you you can answer that, and then I have a, a counter to what you you may answer. So why why would you stay open if you you're you're not making as much money as you could, and you're and you're not really making a windfall approach? I mean, for you to say it's really to serve the community is a fantastic answer. Although from a business perspective, most business people don't don't make decisions based on on that. 
and basically that that's what it is and we had customers that had asked us for a very long time why are you not not open we have to drive all the way to the other 7-eleven and then drive back to wherever they were going towards 101 and that was the only reason that we started and then we said let's do a petition to see how many people want us open and we had over 600 people right. sign that. Right, and I, that, that was, uh, I, I understood that too, and I recognized a lot of those names. Okay, so here's the big question, the one, the one question that was brought up to me that I never thought about before. And I'd appreciate you both to give me the most honest answer you could because I have a feeling this may uncover some motivation that hasn't been discussed. Should your franchise be open 12 to six, or closed from 12 to six? I'm assuming it has a certain value uh, as much as I feel as you're just as part of the community as anybody else, if you decide to sell your franchise, is your franchise worth substantially more because it is now open 24 hours a day? Does, does the ability to have pass on that use permit to the next buyer increase? So if you decided, you know what, I really, I really want to sell this, is my franchise worth more money now that we've allowed it to be open 24 hours a day? Um, with 7-Eleven, being open 24 hours a day, it is worth more money out on the open market. Okay, and if how much? It's not open 24 hours a day, it is worth quite a bit less. Right, and, and, and how, closed, mu how much are we talking about you know, on that type of scale? It's hard to judge because I'm not well prepared. I just came here to support Raj. Um, I, I truthfully don't know. We don't have very many stores that aren't open 24 hours a day. Um, you know, the, the biggest reason that we want to be open 24 hours a day is the community. And I know that sounds trite in this room right now, but it's the truth. The reason we don't sell alcohol from midnight until 2, he could make more money. But we felt it was us giving back a little bit by tr being open till 6. So, so I can't give you a value, but, you know, it can be anywhere from $200,000 to $500,000 when you sell it. Okay, th thank you. Um, I have some questions for, for Misty or the attorney, whichever wants to go, or both. Um, I am totally sympathetic, by the way, although I, I may not show it with some of my questions. I do believe that you feel as though you are impacted. Um, you mentioned uh, at the last meeting something that you hadn't mentioned to us uh, or me uh, in, in my notes over the past year and following this, that you got information that your home was going to be significantly decreased in value. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And who gave you this information? Um, a qualified realtor and with an appraiser. My realtor has been in the business over 20 years. Okay, and um, I think that that's a really significant point. It's a significant number yeah. too. But the problem is, is that I don't, uh, you know, it was brought up here and John said it, that this is a, a political issue. I, I don't see this as a political issue whatsoever. I will, I will never make my decisions as a council member or in any elected official politically. I don't think that's how this works. I think I like to make my, my opinions known based on fact. And if you discovered that your property was going to significantly be worth less based on an appraiser, I can't fathom that you would not get that in writing and turn that in for us so that we could have a piece of evidence to support that claim. I, I believe that people may be coming and urinating from this place. I believe that you have noise. But until I can get my, my claws into fact, it's hard for me to support that claim, and I really would love, I would love to have that in writing because I think that that would make a massive impression on any of those of us who are trying to learn and discover how you're impacted. There's another fact here that I want you to consider, and maybe this is true, and maybe this is not true. When I went down there the other day at 2.30 in the morning because I was walking my animals on a Friday night, I noticed something that I hadn't noticed before. And I sat down across from uh, where the youth center is, and I kind of watched the action that was going on. And I can't believe that none of us noticed this. There is a huge apartment complex directly behind your home. I would ask the chief, how many noise complaints compared to 7-Eleven complaints come from the Sherwood Oaks apartments? Is there an estimate? I mean, is it, is it significant? I mean, do you have call-outs there frequently? 
I think that that's something that none of us have considered. I don't want to make a hasty decision here, but on all four sides, for the most part, with the exception of your next door neighbor, you're on a, you're on an island. You have an apartment complex that I assume have a ton of cars and a ton of people right behind your backyard. I believe that property borders your backyard. Am I right? Okay. You have a 7-Eleven and a three-way stop sign, which is going to be a natural point where people stop. You have a fire department that gets call outs in the middle of the night, um, and that's a certain amount of noise. You have a park, which people will tend to congregate at just because it's a park. So I, again, I'm trying to find how much of the evidence is really 7-Eleven driven and how much are the other factors. I've been living with this. We bought that, the fire department was there. Not a problem. 7-Eleven was there, 7 to 11. It was a convenience in the neighborhood. Not a problem. The apartments were there. Not a problem. I have not had any complaints from, in all of the 22 years from the people in the apartment. The park, I hear the, the sound of child laughter. It's a wonderful thing. I don't complain about that. That doesn't bother me. This, I, can't believe that you're actually asking me for proof that there's noise coming from there and that it is blended into these hours and in the long term i don't see where it's going to get any better we have a, a hub of three bars two of them the music venues that draw people out of the county to come here and the longer this goes on the more everybody's going to know they can take walking distance to 7-eleven and hang out and, and munch or, I mean, the radio in the car, we hear the bass, people don't turn it off. I, I can't believe that you're actually disbelieving that this is a problem. No, no, no. ma'am, I'm, I'm certainly not well, disbelieving. Well, you're asking me for evidence. You're right, and that's because I don't make my opinions based on emotion, I base my opinions on fact. And, I, and I'd like to see your valuation, I'd like to see proof of, of, of how you would be financially um, hit on, on, on the value of your home, although right. I think that makes sense, it's not in front of me. It's a no it's well, it, you're right, but it's a no-brainer, but if, I, if someone says, why did you make that opinion, um, I want to base it on something that was in front of me, not a testimony. Well, uh, if I can make one comment, um, it's very clear case law that public testimony at hearings like this is acceptable evidence on which to base findings. Um, I too thought of the uh, diminution in value and mind you, uh, well, and I did not think it required expert testimony um, and that a layman was capable of testifying to the fact that if you live next door to a 7-Eleven that's open 24 hours versus one that's closed from 12 to 6, um, your home's going to be worth less. Um, so th that's why we, we went that way. And in regards to um, making decisions based on fact instead of politics, I will say that's very refreshing. Um, and I would simply refer you to the code that says, this isn't a balancing test. It's not. It says, is it going to have a negative impact on the adjoining property owner or not? And, and I, I agree with what you're assessing. I, I'm just not completely sold that it's not met because I'd, I'd like to see more evidence to base the fact that that's actually where it's coming from. And we had information that came in here from the police chief saying that actually the complaints and the sound was down because someone is there monitoring the area and that the, that the noise complaints were higher when no one was there to do that. And that's what this tells us. So again, that's why I'm asking. I need, I'd like someone to present enough information, not personal testimony of the person who's the applicant, but other people around that would also, your, your next door neighbor, for example, or other people that live on the block that have witnessed the same things. And, and written testimony from these people, that, that's, that's, that's an important aspect to this. Directly Please really state your name and your address for the record. Um, my name is Megan Arno, and I live at 161 Bolinas Road, directly across the street from 7-Eleven. My house overlooks it. And our bedroom window, I hear it all night. All night. Like, we can't sleep with the window open ever. There's people, I'm constantly woken up if the window's open by people in, and I know it's 7 Eleven too, because I live across the street from the apartments as well. And, but I don't live, like, she lives 
in front of the apartments, I'm directly across from 7-Eleven. So I am like, my window looks at 7-Eleven. Yeah, I hear it a lot at night. Constant noise, cars, drunk people, constantly. So, sorry. <laughs> you don't have like, to be sorry. That's exactly the kind of testimony we're trying to ascertain. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the type of information. I know exactly where you live. Yeah. And, and so you're saying that you do hear a lot of noise yeah. in between the hours of 2 and 6 when yeah. the store is open. Well, I mean, I don't sleep with our window open very much anymore <laughs> because of that exact reason. Like in the summer, sometimes I just go downstairs to sleep because I can't. It, it, it will, if I'll fall asleep, sometimes it wakes me up. Is it the hours between 2 and 6 that are the problem, or is it the hours between well, midnight and 2? Well, when I go to sleep. So I, I haven't really paid attention to between 2 and 6, per se, but I know that I get woken up by it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, right. You have anything else, Ryan? Okay, Larry, go for it. Um, this uh, case actually is uh, in front of us on a directed referral that I filed uh, about a year ago. So uh, I'm partially responsible for the hubbub. Um, and um, I really like the 7-Eleven uh, operators. Um, I patronize the store. They are unfailingly polite and friendly and uh, really uh, they're part of the community too and I think we really need to uh, take that point into consideration most of the guys live here locally and um, they definitely are serving uh, a need for our community um, that being said um, you know it's pretty hard um, to look at the code and then hear the testimony and not think that this particular request um, may cause the type of excessive or unreasonable detriment to an adjoining property. It's an unusual situation because there's no uh, space in between the two zones. One is uh, whatever R1, R3 zone it's directly adjacent to what is now Central Commercial, which, so there's, there's, there's nothing in between it. That's a very unusual situation. Um, if we look at the history of the store, however, it wasn't always the Central Commercial Zone. This was the Commercial Highway Zone, so that particular property was commercial highway and if you look at the, the zoning for commercial highway it specifically says the purpose of the commercial highway commercial zone is to allow a variety of service retail and wholesale businesses with long operating hours diversity of building size and type and short-term parking so I don't really buy the argument that there was no notice to the Morenos that there was going to be extended hours because that was the law for decades uh, in Fairfax that that was commercial highway uh, and commercial highway um, involved ex extended business hours and things change that was originally a gas station it, it was uh, a restaurant um, who knows what it's going to be right now it's been rezoned it's no longer commercial highway. It's central commercial. And as I read the code for central commercial, there's no, there, there is no inclusion in the central commercial zone for extended business hours. It's just not there. And I really think the council, I mean, I know it's a tough decision. Um, I mean, I have great affection and really respect for uh, 7-Eleven and, and this franchise for all of us that live in the area or work in the area. I mean, this 
you know, it's a very difficult decision because we're in and out of there all the time because of the proximity to town hall. But I think as difficult a decision as it is, you've got to be guided by the code. And I think the code is pretty clear um, that, you know, we've got to make findings that are, are based on fact. And um, I don't know if we have sufficient fact to make that finding. Um, and it, it definitely is, uh, causes me a lot of conflict uh, to, to kind of come to this point, really. Um, another thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that if, if we do extend the hours, we are going to increase the value of the franchise. That's, you know, that's part of the deal. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, that's building equity. But I've always guided my decisions on the basis that property rights are reciprocal. And as much as um, the franchise is entitled to attempt to increase its value and increase its equity, you, you've got, the code directs us to look at the impact on the adjoining property. And um, even, even though we, we don't have uh, proof, evidence, admissible evidence. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about the, just going to the noise issue, okay? You know, we don't have a recording every night. Um, we're not keeping a tally. We're looking at police reports. But I don't necessarily think the issue is how many sound complaints have been filed with the town or how many people have called the police. It really does come down to that much abused term, quality of life. And, you know, I, I think folks are are entitled to have some surcease from activity at some point during the day. And um, that's, that's where I'm at right now. So um, that's, that's kind of how I feel at the moment and what, what the record has really brought out to me. Let me take any remaining public comment and then I'll close. Go ahead, please identify your na name and address for the record. Yes. Hi, my name is Michelle Garcia Loss. I live at 200 Bolinas Apartment, number 77, Sherwood Oaks Apartment, directly above um, Misty, actually, and directly behind 7-Eleven. And I was here earlier and left to be home with my kids because my husband's at school right now. And um, I was watching it on, on TV, and I saw Mr. O'Neill speak about the noise from the apartments. Actually, if you go to the apartments right now, they're definitely silent. <laughs> Um, there is noise from the apartments, maybe from the kids that live in the apartments. However, after midnight, I've come home for after attending a family function late at night, or my husband celebrate their family celebrates um, Christmas Eve, uh, and so we've come home at two o'clock in the morning after Christmas Eve, and it's actually really, really quiet to the point where if my kids are making noise, I make sure to to kind of shush them and to kind of usher them into the apartments right away, so there is no noise coming from the parking lot. And then um, also I wanted to talk to s about the 7-Eleven. I mean, and it's n nothing personal, and I don't want anything to think it's anything personal. We go to 7-Eleven all the time with two young boys. It's like their favorite place to hang out. They think it's like Disneyland. And, you know, I um, my kids go to the Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center. And, you know, I know a lot of parents, you know, um, most of them maybe unfortunately that's their primary source for groceries. Um, we know the cost of income in Marin and the cost of food in Marin, and for many people, it's out of reach, so they use it quite often. I just think that, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me that in Fairfax and in Marin County, you can't get a, a restaurant reservation at 10 o'clock at night, but 7-Eleven's open 24 hours. I uh, quite frequently, because of my job, um, during, especially during the school year, will leave at 6 o'clock in the morning and I'm up at like 5.30, we probably drive by 7-Eleven about six o'clock in the morning. The only thing I see in the parking lot are the trucks idling in the parking lot. 
I don't see customers. I don't see people driving there to get coffee. I don't see any of that. As someone who's, you know, I think mentioned about people working irregular hours. My husband used to work at a restaurant in San Anselmo, and so I definitely know about working irregular hours. I most on most days do not most months do not work a nine to five job, and um, you know, 7-Eleven I guess is a nice convenience. But the fact of the matter is when my kids, especially my oldest, was much younger and I needed to get convenience items, I didn't live in San in, in Fairfax, I lived in Larksburg, but even at the 7-Eleven, they don't sell items that you would need as a parent 24 hours, such as formula, diapers, those kind of things. I mean, I just, it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And when he said, when they said it, and I have been asking, well, if they can't sell alcohol, what's the point of being open 24 hours? I mean, it's hard to believe that a business owner is like, oh, I'm going to do it out of the generosity of my heart because I love Fairfax so much, especially a franchise store, a big box store like 7-Eleven. And, you know, I'm the first one to applaud. You know, I'm a big box person. I'll go to Target, whatever, you know. But it just doesn't make sense. And when she said that it increases the amount of their... Um, of, okay. It increases the amount of their franchise... That kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like there is a monetary reason why they're doing it, not because they care so much about Fairfax. And I think, you know, so many people want Fairfax to stay a small community. I love that there is a 7-Eleven, there is a store there, but it just, I don't need it 24 hours, and I don't think most residents of Fairfax, especially in this area, need it 24 hours. CVS is 24 hours. Mommy. Safeway is midnight. I've had to get milk at midnight, you know. Safeway is midnight, and then you have the other 7-Eleven that's, 24 hours as well. So, and you know, I definitely know in my line of work that there are people who don't have mo mobility issues, who can't make it to a grocery store. Stores like 7 Eleven are definitely their primary source of groceries. But I mean, in a town as small as Fairfax, it just doesn't make sense. I lived in Lima, Peru, for a year with my kids, and we lived in a residential community, and we didn't have a store that was open 24 hours. So it wouldn't make sense why a store, why a community as small as Fairfax would need a store that's open 24 hours. So I just wanted to add my two cents. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think this is, is I'm going to close the public hearing at this point in time. Um, I think one of the reasons that this issue has drawn out as long as it is is because I think the, um, a great deal of the council feels like we have a, a responsibility to a business that wants to thrive and serve the community and we have a, responsible to, a responsibility to our residents. And the findings that we have in front of us are inconclusive. Um, I think that, that is the challenge that is before us, and I'm uh, happy to take a, a, a motion at this point or other comments or questions. Ryan? I, I do think I finally figured out that last missing equation um, in the valuation of the franchise from a business perspective that I was looking for for so long as a businessman myself. A lot of the concessions, and there were many that 7-Eleven decided to make, um, were fantastic. Almost surreal that a business would go out of their way to do so much for the community. I mean, if it was, and I think that they're genuine people, and I think that a lot of that is good. But from a business standpoint and a balance standpoint, it's rare. And because of that, I think that the one aspect that we missed, I missed, was was the valuation of the franchise. Um, but I like putting people together to solve problems because I think Misty and her family's concerns are very real. And I don't have one minute of doubt that they are affected by the 7-Eleven. I was very uh, in need of testimony from other residents besides her telling me and validating her and her husband's concerns. Um, in, in an attempt to, to fix this, I asked uh, Misty, uh, and I'll ask you again, uh, is there, is there a, a opposition from 7-Eleven, and I'm throwing this out there as an idea to solve, to perhaps close the store at 2 a.m., allow alcohol sales till 2, and open up at 6, at 6 a.m.? Are you opposed to that from a 7-Eleven perspective? Uh, would, that, would that be okay with you? I mean, as as a, as a as a compromise. Um, okay, so I work for 7-Eleven. They pay my paycheck. 
when he's not open 24 hours, I take more of his money. Right. Okay, I don't know if you, he's ever said that, but I do. Not me personally, but the corporation does. The split's different. Right. He's not open 24 hours. I get more, he gets less. Right. So being open 24 hours, it changed that automatically for him. He right. hasn't said that, but I'll say it, because it makes me look bad and it makes him look good. You know, and the reason that he didn't stay open until two to sell alcohol was to make it a safer environment for a local downtowns. So people walking from the bars right. won't walk over and buy booze and leave. So it's right. not about that extra $200. He's, he owns the other store in Fairfax. Okay. He also just got another store in Napa. That store will be open 24 hours. He okay. has six stores total. Okay. Okay. So it, it's... Okay. I, I hear what you're saying. Can and, I... And uh, then... During all this time, I didn't realize we'd get so heated. I really feel awkward being in this environment because... <laughs> you shouldn't feel awkward. It's all about answers. Um, because it's gotten very emotional. And so I Googled just sitting there to see the value of this house that's next door that's two bedrooms and one bath. I live in Antioch area because I can't afford to live in Fairfax. I lived in Dillon Beach for two years, loved it, can't afford to live here. Marin's expensive. This house next door is valued at $410,000. It's a two bedroom, one bath house. I can buy a mansion for that where, where I live. So, and the house was purchased according to what your property taxes were for $60,000. And that's what it shows right on the internet. So if there's no property value in that, I'm not quite sure if you can go from $60,000 to $400,000. If, if you could, interrupt, I'm going to shut you down right there. That's really not relevant to what we're but, speaking no, about. No, but that's right what now. she spoke of earlier well, she, and said that her value. But that, was her valuation and her financial situation is really none of our concern, uh, other than the fact that if she stands to lose money, it's her money that she's right. losing, not your money she's losing. Okay, right. Misty, can I can I ask you a question, Misty? Um, it, 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 is there an is there an ability with, yes, you, that you, you guys are. You okay. Guys, okay. What I'm. What, what I'm. I know. I know. Um, Will you are, please state your is name it, and add, uh, for the record. Uh, uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor. Yes. If you're going to take new factual testimony, you should open the public hearing again. Yes. If you're just. Even if this is the appellant. Uh, may I finish? Yes. Um, if you're only going to be asking the appellant about a potential solution, and you're not trying to take new factual evidence into the record, you don't have to open the public Correct. testimony. But, but based on what you do, you, you, you have to limit what, what you're saying. If you don't open the, public re po open the public hearing again, you should just limit it to asking them questions about a potential resolution. That's what I'm trying to do. I can respond to then your question. I then I won't open the public hearing, but so, I'll allow so you Misty, to ask questions. So, Misty, you mentioned to me that that would be an appropriate solution as opposed to being open 24 hours a day. You would prefer it to be... So you okay, hold on, hold on. We wait, can't actually, if, without you being at the microphone, um, it's really, so let's. I would rather my turn to handle it. The, the answer is they'd like to go, be able to go to bed at midnight, not 2 a.m., and, and, and that's, that's the answer. 2 a.m. is not reasonable. Midnight is reasonable, and I believe the 7-Eleven representatives um, have misread the fact that they stand to have a great windfall and are now focusing on that. That's not the test. The test is in the code. Please read the code. It's very important. Okay, but in interest to, uh, so so you you are not open to some sort of compromise where they wouldn't be. I'm, I'm just trying to find a middle ground here. The answer is no. You have been asking us a lot already, you personally, and we sorry. have been trying to meet Can the, you, those I'm needs. I'm sorry. I need you to state yes, your name. For yes, ma'am. Sorry. So My name is Peter Marino. I'm from Nine Park Road, and I, I am asking on this appeal to please just close it. You know, we're not asking for a whole lot. I think I discussed this for you the first time I spoke with you, and you know, I came here and addressed everyone and said, please close it. We just need this much to sleep. They they can have that much business that is worth it, there this much trouble. I mean, you have put us against calling the police department, which we chose not to do that because that's not their job. You know, I told you that from the beginning. Their job is different. They come in here and they make the judgment calls. We listen to them. That's what we have to do to have peace. But you haven't been giving us that to us, and that's what I'm asking you. So please listen to me. Don't put us through anymore. Make a vote and make it happen. You can do this. I know that. Thank you. 
At this time, I would like to make a motion to uphold the appeal. If council would like to help me condition the uh, the motion to uh, address how that would fall with regard to the planning commission's uh, action. Uh, so you uh, your your motion is to direct staff to return with appropriate findings to uh, grant the appeal, and there, thereby revoke the uh, the opening hours from midnight to six. Precisely. Okay. So, yeah, that's, Thank you, that's what we'll do with that your direction. Thank you. Um, can you please enlighten me on our uh, revoking the appeal and what impact that might have on our council? Uh, you not revoke. I mean, the appeal is to. Uh, we if we revoke the uh, applicant's <laughs> use permit. Uh, well, then they would not be able to be open for 24 hours. They would go back to what the prior hours was. I don't know if it was seven to 11 or six to six to midnight. Um, whatever the prior conditions were. Okay. Go ahead, David. With you. I'll second it. Motion, Weinsoff, second Bragman. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, seeing none, uh, motion carries. Thank you. The, the, mo the will you explain coming back with findings and what that means as we move forward? Yeah, uh, th this meeting will be, this hearing will be continued technically until the next council meeting at which there'll be a document, a resolution with findings and you can comment on that. And it, it, the decision is not final until that resolution is passed. Thank you, everybody. Let's move on um, to item on our First item on our regular agenda, um, item number 13, authorization of staffs to submit an application of one Bay Area grant funding for Parkade Circulation Program. Uh, Jim, if you want to continue to have a conversation, please take it outside so we can continue our meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, as the staff report <clears throat> indicates, this came in, um, or actually the attachment to the staff report inviting the applications came in on the 20th of September which really didn't allow us any time to, uh, much time to get it to you. Um, but fortunately, <clears throat> you had previously, year before last, accepted the parkade study plan, parkade circulation plan that is, as well as the Cross Marin Bikeway. So we're recommending that you uh, authorize us to make this application to do the improvements that were articulated in the parkade area circulation improvements plan. And um, I might add that <clears throat> the two other items on the agenda tonight um, are candidates also, if you would so like us to apply, on item 14 coming up for the plates as part of the East uh, Cross Marin Bikeway plan that you also accepted, would could be eligible for this uh, application process. And likewise, um, to do a survey uh, for the sidewalk conditions in town. Um, on item 16. The, um, in fact, there's a history to item 16, both in the pedestrian and bicycle plan that was um, re-adopted, if you will, in the general plan's final adoption in, in April. Um, so, uh, and, and with regards to um, item 16, in the new general plan, in the circulation element, there's actually a policy to establish just such a thing under program C, dash 5.7.2, establish a pedestrian priority program that identifies and ranks circulation needs and safe street crossings. And what would be nice to uh, use number 14 in this application process as well as other grant applications is it's very laborious to do these things. Um, you know, staff is very under, uh, we, we have very f limited staff. We have uh, usually more on our plate than we can keep up with, so we have to triage what's the most important. Something actually dropped from the agenda regarding parklets to get this one on in short order, for example. So um, it's going to take some money to do this, to ascertain the critical sidewalk path linking it to the downtown. Um, so at any rate, um, we just recommend that you authorize us to apply for this um, Obey grant, and if you so desire, we can fold 14 and 16 into that when we get to those items. 
Uh, questions or comments from uh, council members? John, go ahead. Okay, I guess I'm real familiar with all of these projects. And um, this project number 13 in front of you, um, I guess is, uh, you know, Jim has referred to it as being familiar to people, but just for members of the audience also, uh, basically it is um, a lot to do with pedestrian access to the parkade and also um, to the bus stop there, transit oriented type of project. And it also includes class two bike lanes along Broadway, which is something that uh, a lot of both bicyclists and motorists have been asking me about for years. Um, and uh, I also met with WTRANS, the, the uh, consulting um, uh, traffic engineers on this project. Um, I also had a conversation today with David Chan at the uh, Transportation Authority of Marin, who is basically the guy who is going to be looking at these projects. And he said that there's actually uh, three different pots of money. Um, one of them is this OBAG grant. It has some strings attached to it in that th we need to check off a box saying our housing element complies with the California thing, which is, as we all know, that's a long, laborious process getting that okayed. But in our best judgment, if we check that box, that means we think we are compliant. And I believe that's the case right it, now, we, is that right? Uh, in, this, in the documents we're attached, we actually have the ability to apply for an extension by November 1st, which I was planning on doing. That's and correct. there's another wrinkle that Mr. Chan may have not gotten into, which I heard from Linda Jackson, who's the planning manager of TAM, which is if we've gotten our comments back from HCD, the Housing Community Development Department, that is the certifying body of housing elements. If we get our rejection letter back by January specifying what we need to do, that puts us into overtime on the grants also. So I'll be following up with applying for the extension. Uh, they're aware, Linda Jackson's aware that we put in our housing element, the final adopted housing element of April. We'll probably get some kickback from the state. We'll probably go a couple of rounds, but it will not preclude us from this. The other piece, just if I may add to what you're saying, is the complete streets. And you had previously adopted a complete streets re resolution, and that was also further strengthened in the general plan that you all adopted in April. That's true. And that's, that's basically what I understood from David Chan today. And long story short, for the non-planners in the, in the room, um, the chances actually look pretty good. I mean, the, the um, we are not in a planned development area and stuff like that along people, you know, people who have a smart future, smart train in their neighborhood uh, are in a planned development area. Um, and so they've got one leg up on us, but not all the money is geared towards those areas. Uh, they need to put money towards areas such as Fairfax. So that's good. The other pots of money are, um, transportation for livable communities money. Um, the other items later, uh, that money applies to that. And then the other thing is um, the LSNR road money, um, which is basically about 50,000, which has very few strings attached and we probably qualify for that too. So basically things look good for all three of these. Uh, I think speaking now to item number 13 on the agenda, which is the downtown one, this is something that's been looked at as part of the East-West Corridor study. Um, it's been developed quite a bit. It's been brought to 5% engineering, which is basically figuring out where everything goes and how it all fits together and the fact that it makes sense and it's safe and things like that. Um, I think it would really help our downtown and you know, it would make things safer and uh, better ADA compliance and um, people will like it. So I support it. Can I just add to what you said? Um, I went perhaps too briefly through the staff report. As you articulated, the Parkade Area Circulation Study calls for sidewalk improvements, bicycle circulation improvements, bicycle parking, signage improvements, additional crosswalks through the Parkade, which we don't have, um, and crosswalk upgrades, are, you know, across Broadway to the Parkade, then the addition of the crosswalks through the Parkade, and then improvements of the crosswalks across Sir Francis Drake. 
um, streetscape and landscaping elements, transit enhancements like our trust bus stop, ADA, ADA access improvements, which are paramount, stairwell upgrades, and parking adjustments, all totaling approximately $434,000. But in, in backing up for a second, the big picture was a lot of the intent behind this particular study was to, to address that age-old frustration with the merchants downtown of the separation of the north side of Sir Francis Drake uh, businesses from the south side of Bolinas because of the parkade sitting between them. We do not have the classic formula, uh, retail formula, which is two-sided retail, except in a little stretch of Bolinas and what has now begun to happen down at the Fair and Cell. Um, so for those out there listening, this is also an attempt to help cohesively bring together Sir Francis Drake retail activities and um, the Broadway retail activities also. So I just wanted to maybe punch that out more since I abbreviated the staff report perhaps too much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from council? Larry? Just, um, yeah, we should go forward on this and um, I'm glad we've got you doing it, leading it. Um, this goes back six years. We got zeroed out originally on these federal grants and um, we ended up sort of getting a Hail Mary pass at the very end which was the parkade pass story and striping now six it's taken six years to actually build them so um, they're good opportunity long-term grants and yeah by all means I support it yes other comments from council I'm gonna take it to the public Andy It's your microphone. <laughs> Andy Perry, Marin County Bicycle Rookie. Coalition. Um, Jim, I wanted to thank you for bringing this forward. And, and I was looking at my agenda, and my 16 is the Halloween parade. And I was wondering how you're going to get OBAG funds for that. But it occurs to me that my document uh, has different numbering systems. Um, anyway, um, I served on the Technical Advisory Committee for the East-West Study, which included the Parkade Study. And um, this project, th there's a number of different scoring criteria on here, including connectivity, multimodal access, and safety. So from a bike pad perspective, I think there's a lot of good um, good chances that you can get this, as John already indicated. Um, this piece of Broadway is uh, a really key feature uh, for really advanced riders. It's not as critical, but for uh, especially for kids going from the east side of town to the west side of town, which many do to go, go to go to school. Um, having bike bike pad improvements in that area is going to be really um, really important. Um, regarding the complete streets policy, um, Jim, that you mentioned. It's true, and MCBC helped draft the complete streets policy that you passed with the bike ped uh, plan several years ago. But there's a provision in this document, if you do get OBAG funds, that a new complete streets policy needs to be passed or a modified version of the one which creates nine, which uh, requires nine criteria to be included. The resolution that you guys passed has, I think, one or two of them. I don't think it'll be a difficult thing, and I'd be happy to work with you, Jim, and the rest of the council to uh, get the language. It is in the uh, OBAG call for projects document that you have. Um, so that's all my comment. I just, uh, we very strongly support uh, applying for these funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment on this? Seeing none, I'm going to close our public comment and bring it back to the council for a motion. Can we do a combined motion? for the two items, uh, 13 and 14. That's up to John Reed, who's on number 14. Well, we can. John, you want to make um, a motion? Or? Well, I can talk. To, there's more to say. All right, oh, let's then. just do 13 then. I'd, I'd move approval of item 13. Second. Motion, Bragman, second. O'Neill, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Item number 14. Before we take that up, can we get Joe McLean out of here on the two seconds it's going to take us to get rid of uh, uh, number 15 on Halloween? Um, we approved the consent calendar. <laughs> so we mi we missed your uh, we missed your opportunity to say things about the GMO film. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm I'm fine with moving 15 up so that we can have that conversation. It's past 10 o'clock. What are we going to get I I guess it kind of depends on what we think, how long we think the discussion is, and whether there's uh, urgent items. Larry, the last two are yours. Ryan, one of 
maybe um, it, it depends where I mean, I mean my, my items um, there there is somebody here actually Janet Klein has been patiently waiting mm -hmm. um, she was going to comment um, she is well then the, let's hit that one and not make her come back she could come <laughs> you don't uh, she, I, she's <laughs> local she's local yes so. but I it's <laughs> torture um, I don't know it's whatever whatever the council's place. It item, item 18 I would say I, I would like it's going to be a very brief comment by me mm -hmm. so um, I guess part of the question is how quickly John and Ryan do you think your items are well I know well? I probably scared people by saying there's more to say but there's not you did. that much okay. more to say, so. <laughs> Um, my sense is let's try to get through it and get it done so that Thanks. we don't have to have another meeting. I support that. Um, and since Joe's not here, did, where did he go? <laughs> uh, why don't we go ahead with number 14, John. Okay. Um, <clears throat> number 14 I put on the, on the agenda uh, as a result of a couple of collisions between uh, cars and uh, in one case a pedestrian and in one case that was an injury accident in another case a bicycle um, that was uh, complaining of pain so that's technically not an injury and it is in a, a, a problem intersection that we have in town that's at Azalea and Broadway and this is one of the intersections that was looked at as part of the east-west corridor uh, for the you know bicycle study um, this particular intersection has problems with, um, it, you know, sight lines, and uh, it, it's controlled in three directions, but not the fourth, um, just because of the topography that's there. And um, it's it was made a three-way stop a number of years ago. Um, it's on the east-west corridor. The stop sign gets run a lot of times by bicyclists. Uh, and there's complaints by that. It's been the location of a sting operation by the local police because of that. Um, the bicycle that got hit by a truck about a little over a month ago, um, I know I said two weeks in the staff report, but I wrote it a couple of weeks ago. Um, he actually lost his brakes on the bike and end, end up going through that stop sign. Um, so I don't know exactly how we can address that, um, but I just found that out today. Um, nonetheless, a speed table was recommended for this particular intersection along with uh, seven others, six others along that stretch through Fairfax. And basically what a speed table is, is a raised section of pavement that encompasses the entire intersection. Um, it tends to um, make all traffic slow down because they have to go across this, you know, change in elevation. Uh, it really gets everybody aware that they're tr entering an intersection and they should pay attention and look around, which is really what's necessary. Um, along Lansdale Avenue, we have three intersections which are teeny little postage stamp things and it's, you know, there's pedestrians, bicycles, and cars coming out of the little things. There, currently, there's stop signs along there which lots of people swear at and um, they were put in a number of years ago to stop speeding cars from going around Center Boulevard and just taking off down this really narrow little street. Um, it's caused a problem and probably speed tables were recommended there also. We don't have enough money in these sources of funds to put speed tables on all these seven intersections. Um, there probably is enough to address this one intersection here. Uh, David Chan was saying, well, you don't want to slow bikes down too much because you know that might be seen as a detriment to us getting the money. But uh, there, it also needs a crosswalk probably too. The pedestrian was hit crossing uh, Azalea from you know from the Fairfax Lumber end to the library end, and um, basically the testimony from the driver and the pedestrian indicated that you know there was too much going on. There was people not knowing how to use the intersection properly, and he was stopped in the middle of the place waiting for some other people to go who were intent on going. At any rate, I would love to put this in the same basket with um, 
what Jim was suggesting earlier and apply for funds to do this at the same time. I just wanted people <laughs> to be aware that there's a bunch of things also going on. It's 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 an interesting place Mayor. where all these projects come together. So, thanks. Gotcha. Is this a good time to bring in 16? If you would like to, I'd love to it, bring it into 16 at the same time. I think time. that's appropriate because it's right. On it, the same it fits it, right with it. Jim, do you feel that these all can fit in the OBAG funding request? Is this something that you, you're at least willing to look at, have staff look at this? This is, I mean, this is the the request is that we're basically asking staff to look at look at finding well, if funding. I, if for I, these I may, ISIS actually, items. Mayor, Mayor, if I will, um, I'd say OBAG and the TLC project money and the LSNR road money. I mean, okay. those are three different pots of money and. And the, the, the different uh, different project. I can work together with Jim to relay what um, David Chan's comments okay. were. But. Ms. Mayor, can I, may I? Ryan, yes. Well, uh, the reason, and I'll bring 16 into this too. Um, my neighbor uh, up on, on Madrone uh, stopped me as we often get stopped to address issues and mentioned that the lights were out on the crosswalk, and why did the town pay to put on under light crosswalks when they won't when they're not working? And uh, I went and talked to Judy about it and to find out the answers. And, and I was kind of startled to find out that the reason we don't uh, upgrade those or up upkeep with this is because of the project that, or the, the lights underground that we installed cost $600 a piece to replace, like an insane amount of money to keep. So although it's a great idea when you first put them in and wow, my town cares, there's not too much afterthought of how much it costs to maintain these things, similar to buying a piece of open space and then having to pay for its maintenance. So so seeing this, I asked Judy, Judy mentioned to me that there was in San Anselmo, I was wondering why San Anselmo dug up their lights one day only to put new ones in. And then I found out that the reason was because they found an LED system that was much more efficient for costs and replacement. So the amount of money it would cost to replace, I don't know how many light bulbs are underneath the ground at 600 bucks a piece obviously offset the cost of putting in a whole new system where you didn't have to pay so much to do that. So I was able to answer um, Gene and Lee, my neighbors, in regard to why it is that they are not working, but it made me think, and, and after talking with, uh, with Judy, that we ought to put this all into one big comprehensive package. There is a, uh, um, we, we were talking about uh, the M&G crosswalk across the street to the grocery store. I, I can't think of a more dangerous crosswalk where drivers are in a movement section where they're not really concentrating on a pedestrian in that location, yet there are a lot of pedestrians in that location and you get into a, an autopilot mode right there. And so I th because this one intersection brought it up, I think we do need to do some sort of comprehensive approach, much to what you're talking about, to comprehensively address where that money might be needed and and really kind of direct staff to lay out that, that process for us. Um, Jim, will you tell me if you have, I, mean, I understand that there's a sort of a deadline on this grant and there's a limited, there's limited funding on these numerous grants. Uh, is this, I mean, is, is combining all of this sort of together or something that staff, you're ready to kind of, you're I'm, I'm able fine to with sort it. out? I'm fine with it, and I can, you know, confer with John and uh, David Chan and Linda Jackson to make sure that we're not overloading, and um, and then, you know, with your direction, I'll go after any funding we can. It's always a challenge of doing our normal day-to-day -day activities, and I would remind you, a lot of this normally falls in public works, and we're not fully staffed in public works right now. Judy's wearing four hats. One of them's public works director, and part of the public works staff has taken my building officials time away from planning and building. So once we get fully staffed and back up and running and on an even keel, um, I look forward to the day when the town has the resources, the staff resources, um, which means financial resources, to fully avail itself to the funds that are out there to promote these good planning things. We're ahead of the curve on the planning, the advanced planning side. Now we just sort of lack the nuts and bolts infrastructure staff-wise to go after all that's out there. It takes a great deal of fortitude. It's, it's sort of, you know, it frustrates me every time we have a senior planner putting stamps on an envelope to mail out. Um, you know, you don't take, you don't need a public works director to go after a lot of these grants. You just need um, a fully staffed department and appropriately allocated task, and then we're off and running. Right now, you know, Judy's wearing four hats. Um, 
we're understaffed, we have no admin and planning, yada, yada, yada. You've heard this all before. So, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're doing, I think, a, a fairly reasonable job. Um, there's some, you know, bumps along the road where some things get pushed by the wayside that don't seem to be the highest priority, at least don't appear to be the highest priority. So forgive us in advance when that happens, but we have to triage our work sometimes. So I'm, all I'm saying is, we will continue to do everything we can. Half of my shop is in current planning. Actually, a third of it's in current planning. The other's in the building side. But we have regulatory requirements for a lot of what we do where we can't stop and look at long-range stuff all the time. We're doing what we can. This came along. It seemed like it was perfect for what we had done. We can capitalize on the housing element that we've done, the complete streets, even though um, I welcome Andy's articulation about the nine points. I had actually had a sidebar conversation with Linda Jackson to make sure that our complete streets thing was adequate, and I thought that the way we had beefed it up in the general plan was going to cover those points. I'm now going to have to circle back to make sure that between now and <clears throat> when these things are funded, we've got all the T's crossed and I's dotted. It, you know, it's a laborious challenge to keep up just with the notice of funding for these things, let alone applying for them and following up. So anyway, I don't mean to um, discourage any of this. I'm just saying we run at a fast pace. We're doing all we can, but please remember the limited situation we're in right now. I think that's why my question to you is, yes. is this no. too much on no, this grant? No, no, it's just a matter <laughs> of, these are, these are ready-built things we just list. It's just we don't want to... Um, we're not going to get a, all of them in most likelihood. You know, if we if we picked one we really wanted, then um, you know that that would be the priority. We could prioritize them too, but at any rate, enough. Okay, so is this something that you would then bring back to us with with asking us for priorities, or is this something no, that you would no, prioritize because there's the not enough staff? No, it would time, run, We have time. to turn this in on the 18th. Right. The 18th of October. Okay. The old bank is it was a you know time sensitive thing and, and it. Right. Worked right in, as John knows, in with something that we've already adopted. It's kind of ready to go. Uh, this thing with this, with the crosswalks and so forth, is a little more long term. We've got to evaluate what we've got, see what we're talking about in costs, what needs to be done, and that's what Ryan and I decided after we talked about this for a while. It's fine to know about this crosswalk that's not working and maybe wasn't designed well, but we've got a lot of crosswalks in town, and so. Our conclusion, if don't correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, is that we want to look at all the crosswalks, right. see what they need, uh, prior to prioritize the ones that need the most help, and then see what funding is out there. The old bag thing, I think, is this is something we're going to do. We brought it to you now because we've got a, something ready to go, and it has to be done right away. Right. That's it can't really be tied in with the way I'm looking at this other thing. This is a little more long term. Okay. Interesting. Yes. I, I had a slightly <clears throat> varied take on it, which is a, doing what Ryan wants to do in 16 is a project in and of itself before you get to sure. what it is. Yeah. And so that would that would possibly qualify Maybe, if you yeah. wanted to. The other ones, John's 14 and my 13, yeah. you, they've, you've seen them. They're there were long processes. Yeah. The two of you served on them. You know, they're ready-made, analyzed, digested, baked, ready to eat. This one, you know, I would say is probably low on the totem pole that we would get the funding for that. Here again, if, you know, public works, there's a bigger world out there. If I may. Ryan. Uh, so it, I think that you guys are doing a fantastic job, and it's really easy for us to, you know, take an idea, throw it on your plate and say, please take care of that, and then go on to the next thing. Um, I think that the key for us to, is to make sure, um, as I recognize as a new council member when Cindy Ross brought up the fact that we had passed something uh, years ago against domestic violence, and I wasn't here and I wasn't a, 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 you know, aware of it as a new council person, but as long as the ideas get on a, a board or a checklist and don't just f a, an idea that we all kind of think we need to take care of it's not it wasn't imperative to me that this get done now but it, that it get on the to-do list and not necessarily be erased from the memory and I think as long as we are attacking the, the, the processes and the projects we we feel are the most um, important to our town and we can get the the manpower and the money behind the most important projects I think as long as it's on our checklist we're, we're, we're doing our job and as long as it doesn't just get forgotten and someone else has to bring it up later I think that, that that's all I would ask Okay, let me um, let me take public comment, and I don't know Could if I we've just, yes. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, you know, um, just I don't know if you've talked to Mark. Mark actually did a survey of the the crosswalks and curbs 
with uh, Van Mitty, Ted Van Mitty, which I should have probably forwarded to uh, Ryan, but there's a lot there's a, a lot to do. I don't want to belabor the point. If you can get it done, do it. But we do have some data that's already in the hopper from Van Mitty where he actually went out to the problem areas, some of which you mentioned, uh, some of the ones that you mentioned, I should say. So, um, and it is a question of prioritizing our resources. And, um, and I would echo what you just said. ADA is, and that's why Mark does that work. He's our, as the building official, our ADA compliance officer. And ADA, in our world, is right up there in the top. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Anything else from council before I take it to the public? Okay. I just wanted to say, in my conversation with David Chan, he's tried to streamline this application process. It's like a, basically a one-page fill out the thing. The biggest time consuming thing is probably estimates on cost which we, we've got it you've in the cross marine bikeway each of those tablets were itemized that's true and in the um, pedestrian circulation plan each they're dated two years dated maybe they're less um <laughs> well with the economy who knows there's, well there's, anyway it's going yeah, to turn I, around i would check the figures in that because yeah. i've noticed some of them are off yeah well we'll we'll date it and you can yeah. do a you know yep a cpi analysis on it but anyway Okay, and I believe we're going to go ahead and take public comment on both 14 and 16 in order to streamline our process so here. Andy yes. Perry, again, um, I wanted to point out that, um, so just in terms of definitions, OBAG is one barrier grant, and all of the funding pots are under one barrier grant. So OBAG is the overall name for it. There's surface transportation, the CMAC, which is the air quality money, and the transportation alternatives. Um, just for clarity on that. Um, I did notice, I'm looking at the staff report here, and there is a CMA planning and outreach pot of money. It's not a huge amount for the whole county, but there is some there. So what I would encourage, and, and Jim, understanding the staff issues here, but I would encourage uh, a conversation about the crosswalk thing too, because if there's planning money available, maybe they could take uh, Van Mitty's work and expand it out and turn it into something so that when the next round of funding, including Measure A or whatever, you might have funds available to actually do that. I've crossed an M&G. It's a good place to say a prayer. Um, regarding um, the general plan, Jim, I had forgotten about the fact that during the general planning process, we did uh, try to craft language that met AB 1358, which is the Complete Streets Act of um, 2008. And I think uh, I think Fairfax is in pretty good shape. It's very difficult to discern whether or not you've qualified because there's no uh, metrics for doing that, even in the guidance from the state but you may be in good shape without doing. So I'm retracting what I said about the nine, Linda's nine points. Sta Linda's staff had looked at the general plan section. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then other than that, uh, I just more support for going forward with these and OBEG too, if you guys can, can handle doing it all. But working with Linda and David, I mean, they can tell you which, you don't have to know any of the stuff about the funding pots. You go to David and he's the magician that will figure out all the Rubik's Cube maze of things to get through for you, so. I, I did. I did at the planning director's lunch last week. I did give Linda Jackson, who is again the planning manager, a little bit of an earful full because she had been the deputy planning director in San Rafael. And I said, "Wouldn't you want to take this to your council before you applied?" And I got a, a blank stare back. Yes. <laughs> Great. Any other public comment on 14 or 16? Please come forward. Chief, will you? Oh, there you go. Thanks, Andy. Oh, thank you. Uh, I do. Uh, I do have issue with the curb cuts at M and G, which I personally. Uh, they're very dangerous. The trying to get up into the uh, driveway at uh, the uh, by the bicycle shop is like this big of a jump up under the, you know, and you got to go across the crosswalk at a 45 degree angle out of the M and G in order to be able to get in the crosswalk. The curb cuts are needing improvement very badly for a wheelchair. Uh, that's the only issue I have right now. Thank you very much. You're very Cindy. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I hope, like just this morning, actually Larry Bragman and I um, did some talking and some walking around town and I really, really hope that we can, you know, that some of us, you know, members of the public can be included in helping prioritize which crosswalks are um, 
you know, should be addressed. Um, I did have the chance, Larry was kind enough to forward me a copy of Mr. Van Mitty's report. I, I didn't really get a chance to look at it that closely, but um, there are a number of other places as well, and I agree with, and I apologize, I don't, I don't know your name, but, uh, oh, okay, with Mr. Green. You know, I agree that the curb cuts, not only by M&G, but a number of, of locations around town are just really screwy, you know, where in order to get into the crosswalk, you know, you have to kind of go at strange angles and there are curbs where, you know, where it should be, you know, some kind of a depression to go down. I know today my, my mother came to the meeting as well. She sometimes uses a motorized scooter. Um, I know with myself walking, it's really, really difficult. And I, I'm just hoping that some of, you know, it, it's very difficult for us living on the east end of town to get to the west end of town and also across to Sir Francis Drake. So I, I know this issue has been brought up a number on a number of occasions before, but there's also a real problem area trying to get from Bank of America to First Federal Bank or anywhere across to Sir Francis Drake from there. And I realize that it's been, you know, it might be expensive or whatever. There's actually no crosswalk there, but I, I don't know a safe way for people to get across across the street. Yeah, and I so. know that, that that hill is is I know that part of the issue yeah. there. Maybe. Ryan, go ahead. But Cindy, you, this has been kind of a uh, something you've been championing uh, a lot of these meetings. I would make sure, and I would encourage you to really get on the front end of this when you see this on the agenda, as it's hard to make changes as we noticed later today on the fifth reading of something else to jump in with an opinion. You do have a lot of opinions, and we value them. But I, I would challenge you and, and, and hope that you would be on the front end of these discoveries of crosswalks because you're very knowledgeable and you have a very good opinion on what they are to get on and get the information into us early when we do start to generate these leads so that you can, you can your input would be great. Yeah, yeah, and I'm saying the input early as opposed to late, it'll help all of us make sure you're included, all of your thoughts, are, you're, you're kind of ahead of us on the issue. So it'd really be great if you were paying attention when those things showed up on the agenda to get here early and, and get heard as opposed to later and and I do want to just put that out there. I mean, you know, you, you know that I have been bringing this up. I brought it up at a number of different meetings. You know, I'm open anytime, you know, to to meet with anybody. I'll, I'll be to, sure to you know, call you input. and let you know when it's on the agenda so you, you'll be here meeting one and we'll go no, from there. Pl please do, do or, or even before it gets on the agenda. I mean, you, you, know. could, you could make a list, for instance, maybe of the places that you see as the most troublesome spots. That would be helpful. Okay. You know, we have a certain amount of the budget. We don't have to wait for grants for some things. We're trying to do okay. the most critical ones first. Um, and so your input would be valuable, and we'd okay. love to have it. You know, whether you want to call me and talk to me about it or give me a written list or something that we can okay. use, that would be great. Okay, right. thanks. Can I just chime in for a second? Cindy, sure. the yeah. policies in, I'm over here, sorry. The okay. policies. For a second, I didn't know the who policies, was talking to me. The, the good news is the policies are in place. The general plan was adopted in April incorporated the bicycle and pedestrian plan. The first recommendation in the pedestrian facility improvements in the pedestrian and bicycle plan is infill of walkway gaps. That's been a policy since 2009 now. Again, it comes down to wherewithal to do those great things. So, you know, as we get more revenue for the town, those would be, those should be the highest priorities, or at least my recommendation anyway. So the good news, the policy's in place. You, you don't have to make people want to do this. The powers that be have already decided to do it. Now we have to find the resources to go get it done. And I'm with you totally. And that's their direction. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, is there any other public comment on this item? On these 14 and 16? I'm going to close that and um, uh, ask for a motion. And I don't know if we need two different motions here, one for 14 or. Is the direction the same? Is to, to seek the funding that, that's identified in the yes. Seek the funding for I that could be the, the installation and seek the funding for the survey. I would so move to uh, direct staff to seek funding for these two motions. I'll second. Okay, Fourteen and sixteen. Motion read. Second. O'Neill. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Uh, motions carry. 
Um, we are on to Halloween. Um, and I know that uh, <laughs> I know that Joe's probably gonna. So b both Ryan and I sort of brought brought issues to the council on this. Um, I had been talking to David Smed back last year uh, during the Halloween parade about the safety issues for the kids because there's just a bazillion kids who come from the theater up to the park and they overflow into the parking spaces and it's chaos and craziness. And, I, and I'm gonna jump the gun a little on what Joe's probably gonna say because I heard from David and Wendy both today at the Chamber of Commerce saying, um, what if instead of blocking off Bolinas Road, we clear, clear parking, clear the parking lanes instead. That way traffic can kind of keep going, but people who are kind of overflowing the curb won't be um, uh, having as much trouble. So that's sort of the, that's been kind of the, that was the uh, Bolinas Road issue that kind of came to me. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and let Ryan talk about the Dominga, and we may wanna deal with them together or separate, probably wanna deal with them separately because they're two different issues. Well, um, I'll stick to the, my side of things. As a, a father of a, a three-year-old and a six-year-old uh, and being kind of excited to participate in the Halloween adventure as a father, um, where you have independent little moving people as opposed to you pushing the people. Um, it, 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 I, I participated in something last year that I didn't expect, but it was absolutely fantastic. And um, a lot of the questions that I pose on this um, are, are important to get the feedback from the residents of Dominga. Um, but what had happened was they had, they had a, sh a block that was shut off, and all of the children um, were free to go door to door and do their trick or treating. But there was no threat of motorized traffic in this area, so it took the sidewalks and the streets. The parents were watching as as a group of parents. Uh, shepherding children um, from place to place without having to have your head on a swivel is, is my child going to get hit by a car? Um, in other areas, uh, downtown Mill Valley has a, a similar situation where it's known that this is a gathering place for young children and parents to trick or treat as opposed to having multiple uh, areas of the town that are um, chaotic or, or, or dangerous. Um, um, motorists do have to drive on Halloween to either drop children, pick up children, come home from work sometimes. And I think it's probably one of the darker nights of the year typically. And, and it's, there's a lot of chaos and action. So what I was able to do was actually go down to an area where there were no cars. There were hundreds of people. The, uh, um, the residents of the area were incredibly festive. I, I, I mentioned in my staff report here, or my report to you all that uh, I live on the mountain. I don't get any trick-or-treaters. I don't even bother putting up anything because no one's walking up the hill to go to the den and the one dark house at the end of the cold at the end of the street. Um, but I felt a tremendous. Uh, I learned of a tremendous burden also on these families that were down there as I was knocking on doors campaigning in the weeks, uh, the days right after Halloween last year. Um, and I spoke to uh, almost everyone on that block. And I learned that there's a tremendous financial burden to participate in this. Although there are amazing um, displays and uh, fire breathing machines and you know haunted houses and people open up their garages for decorations. It, it's an amazingly festive area, um, but the burden of finance to supply treats um, is significant. And, and so what I noticed was going around on maybe as a, an impromptu kind of thing was a lot of the parents were passing a hat around to try to collect money because they were so um, enamored with the situation that their kids could all trick or treat a whole block at one time and not have to worry about you know anything else. It was a great event. You take your kid home and it's the end of it. Everybody's safe. Uh, the, one of the most impressive parts to me was an amazing community bonding. Um, most of the children know each other from school, but a lot of the parents that work um, that maybe not drop off their kids don't have a chance to, to, to talk a lot. And it was a great opportunity to meet a ton of people that, of, of, that have children of that age. So in interest of safety and trying to make sure you have support of the community in which it most affects, which is the Dominga, um, I, I, it was my vision that after the parade of children, there's going to need an outlet for them, and that was the natural outlet across the street and over to Dominga. Um, I think I put the hours on here to close that street down from traffic till 10 o'clock. I think that's a little late when I really think about it. Um, and, and in fact, that, that I just put that out there because this, this is a discussion, not necessarily what I think should happen. Um, but as a parent, I would strongly want my child to participate in an, in a, an event in an area that is being, um, it's being parented 
by all the adults, the miscreants or the people that would be causing havoc later on in the evening are not in this area, um, you know, causing problems because there are so many adults around and it's a very festive event that I think that if we had the support of the people and the support of the town to help clean up and to help uh, uh, maybe have a drop off of candy so people would know that if you're not having people but you want to participate, you could either drop funds or drop candy or treats, I should say, off so that they can be dispersed out by maybe a a, a person that would head it up. I talked to a couple of the, the, the residents there and they mentioned that they would be happy to chair the event and they would be the treat drop and they would disperse it. Everyone on the block would know, hey, if you're running low, you go over to Mary's house and you grab a couple bags of treats. And, and I, I thought it was just an amazingly win-win situation provided that the town helped support the cleanup effort and uh, from a safety perspective, I just don't think there can be anything better for our kids. Great. Um, let's get, uh, maybe the chief wants to, <laughs> or, or Judy, want to kind of spe speak to, okay. to but, um, I mean, and maybe both the Bolinas Road okay. issue as well as the yeah. Dominga. We we maybe we could just address Dominga, because that's easy. If the town wants to close it, we'll close it. That's not a logistical problem at all. Uh, it's safer. The kids go there anyway. I think last year, I'm pretty sure it was last year, someone uh, paid the $35 street closure fee and we closed it. So if we want to do that on our own, easy, done. Okay, and that allows certain, it, it allows people who live on the street to kind of pull into their spots or not? Well, the barricades can be moved. So and if the, they really want to get in, right. the barricade can be moved. They can slowly drive in, but they yeah. know there's people in the road. Right. People that need to get out, you could do the same thing, but. Last year, there was not an issue with it, people coming or going. Mm -hmm. and I, so I had, and, that, and would that be from Sherman to Pacheco? We did it on from, Dominga from, and Napa? We did it from or? Pacheco all the way to Sherman. Okay. Although, if we wanted to, after I evaluated it last year, we, we, they wanted it all the way to Creek, and I only approved it to Sherman, not real, mm -hmm. realizing if there's going to be an issue. Since there wasn't an issue, I'm fine with going all the way to Creek from, from Napa mm -hmm. or from Pacheco. Okay, let's bring it. Uh, Judy, did you want to say anything else about well, I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm assured by the chief that he couldn't safely close that, couldn't guarantee safety by closing the parking spaces along Broadway. I know that's come up before. And I just, they, I haven't had anybody in the police department tell me that's possible to do safely. So I wouldn't recommend that. It sounds like there's a, it worked with Dominga, and that one's possible. I wouldn't recommend um, trying to make Broadway wider there where the cars are. It'd be hard to do and, and make sure the kids would be safe. Um, I wouldn't recommend closing Dominga and Bellinas. I just think that would be too much. And, I, and my sense is that, and I don't know what the timing it would be on closing Dominga. I know that a lot, you know, most of the kids who go to Dominga participate in the parade. The parade and then end up goes there. pretty quickly. And and that, and that and maybe Joe can kind of speak to what the chamber's desire was, because they're the sort of they're the sort of sponsors for the parade, but and they they're the ones go, who brought it to me. We do have things in the park as well. Yes. You know, so they end up in the park, and then they go right. usually over to Dominga. So I mean, my thought on it before I saw what Ryan and put forward was that you know maybe the Bellinas just that little one little stretch of Bellinas would be closed for like the one hour or the one main bulk hour of the parade that is and I mean I spend every Halloween sitting in the Chinese restaurant watching that parade go by and there's really like the first hour of it is like a madhouse and there's definitely kids falling into the streets and and you know and it's because and their event starts at five and the, the event starts at five so my thought was maybe like what if we if there's is there a way to you know close Bellinas from maybe five to six, and then start the Dominga closure. You know, a little later. And I don't. I mean, I don't know. And maybe, maybe Joe can kind of talk about what the chamber's desire is on the issue, because I know you're here to represent the chamber on this one. This is, uh, uh, David. I know. <laughs> we hit the microphone and say your name really quick for our record. Yeah. There you go. Hi, I'm Joe McWilliams. I'm at 19 Broadway Farmers. Okay, I've been in Fairfax since 78. Uh, I've been doing the parade for a number of years, and it's grown uh, to be of sizable proportion. 
And we've always been lucky enough to be able to have the movie theater and 19 Broadway allow us to use as a staging area for the children and the parents to get ready and go. My only suggestion would be to, um, from the movie theater down to Grilly's, and it's only a suggestion, would be to um, block off that parking for perhaps one hour just for that first flow. And then once they turn the corner, they're pretty much on their own. The merchants know uh, they're coming. It's a, it's a huge event. It gets bigger every year. My main concern is safety. We have a lot of hooligans, as somebody brought up earlier, run across the street between uh, one side to the other. And when there's parking available on that one side, it creates issues of people running between and forth cars. And I'm worried about somebody coming out and getting hit by a car. So if we could perhaps have no parking there just from, I would say, even from four to six, that would alleviate a lot of that pain. If it's not possible, I totally understand it. We'll have plenty of volunteers to um, guide the children and make sure that nobody gets hurt. And that, that would be my only concern. We did it years ago, and it worked. And last year, it became sort of an issue. So that's, that's, all, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let me bring it back to council at this point for input right, or questions or comments. Brian? You know, in thinking about the closing off a side of parking, uh, A, on a night uh, where if you do have cars that are going to be driving past all these kids, they're going to be distracted. I don't think taking parking away is necessarily the answer. Giving children the ability to walk in a location that's getting closer to vehicles probably presents more of a danger than having parked cars there that they know they're walking between two parked cars and then there's another probably a moving car it may give a false sense of security you're actually then putting children closer to moving traffic on a day where uh, if you see a couple ninjas ghosts and a couple princesses right by your car you're you're gonna you're not gonna be paying attention to driving as much as you probably should be so i i would probably not uh, encourage taking away the parking keep the kids on the sidewalk if, the, if it takes longer to get all the kids down the sidewalk um great it's a better show but i think i think putting more children in a wider area uh, could only just decrease the safety john I concur wholeheartedly with that. I mean, I think it's really dangerous uh, having this parked cars there. I mean, they take up a lot of room and they make that sidewalk really skinny. But having just participated today in this um, international walk and ride your bike to school and work day or whatever the title of it is, um, my job was to herd kids back onto their side of the street. And, you know, there was, you know, the, they were supposed to be, you know, pretty much towards the bike lane, but, you know, the fire truck was taking up the main lane. There was kids definitely getting into the oncoming lane of traffic, and, you know, they needed constant reminders to get back onto the right side of the road. And now they, add sugar. Sorry? Now, now add sugar yeah. to that equation. Yeah, add sugar to it and the pandemonium and the excitement of, how, I mean, Halloween is a big deal for anybody under the age of 10, you know, I mean... Uh, you know, end of year holidays or something else again, but Halloween was always my son's favorite day of the year. And um, yeah, I mean, Dominga is, I would echo your thing. I mean, I think we've got to support the people putting on that party for the town. I mean, it's quite good and it definitely goes all the way up to Creek. Um, it's, you know, it's fun for the parents too, you know, and uh, it's, it's a great community event and, um, yeah, I think we need to keep the kids safe. And, you know, I mean, it's one of the issues that came up with Streets for People is like, well, do we make the, you know, keep the cars in the middle and make the sidewalks wider? Keeping the cars off of that street made it for people. But unfortunately, parked cars keep the moving cars away from our kids. So I agree on that. Okay. So, and I, and, I, and I know my original proposal was to shut Bolinas down and then have there be a gap, you know, have there be a time frame where Bolinas is shut down and then have there be a time frame where Dominguez is shut down. I think the, the parking, the removing parking idea kind of came from the chamber. 
and i'm cu i'm curious to hear maybe from the chief how, what what are the best ways we can potentially address the safety issues of the parade overflowing the sidewalks well, i agree with the John and Ryan, those were my points last year when they wanted to take the parking lane away. But I can't safely, I can't keep everyone safe if they're in that lane. There's just, tra just reiterating what they said. It's just not safe. So I, I would recommend against that completely. Because um, even if we did want to put them there, we don't have enough barricades and that's, they're still not safe. We can't effectively close that down. We're giving them a false sense of security by putting them out there. Um, as far as closing Bolinas, unlike Streets for People, where we all said, we don't know what's gonna happen. That was a weekend, you know, we, we didn't know, and that turned out fine. Um, closing, whether it's Broadway or Bolinas, on a weekday at commute hour for Fairfax commute, I, I can say, unlike Streets for People, it will be a disaster. Because last year, because this was brought up, um, I watched it specifically for traffic. And Bolinas, with nothing closed, just because of the spectacle of the parade, Bolinas is backed up way past SNN without any relief. And Broadway, both lanes are backed up down past Center Boulevard. I was directing traffic at the intersection just to try to keep things moving. Closing either roadway in any, any aspect, I think, is going to be horrible. Um, and, and again, for the short duration that we're talking about, if you want to talk about logistics of setting it up, getting cars out of the way, towing them if necessary, setting it up, taking it down. There's a lot of, a lot of logistics involved for the short duration of the actual parade. Um, keeping them on the sidewalk, as Ryan and John both said, the cars actually help keep them on the sidewalk. Yes, there's a lot. If it takes an hour and a half to finish the parade instead of 30 minutes, so be it, because there's so many children. But effectively, they're trick-or-treating to the businesses anyway. Um, so they need to be on the sidewalk as opposed to the street takes a little longer to get them through I think that's better because it's safer for them okay other comments from council members questions oh I, I had listed a couple questions on this report I one was um, does the police chief like the idea of centralized area to police rather than a sprawl and I assume that you answered that by saying what you're gonna say next <laughs> <laughs> well we don't we Yes and no. We're not going to just concentrate our patrols there because, in essence, that's actually the safest place that we don't need to be because all the parents are there. The road's closed. We're going to be in the other areas of town where either we're being called to right. or, or where, where the hooligans aren't really going to cause any trouble with all these parents and these so many kids. It's usually areas where there's less people. Right. So, so, so I could assume that it's, in your opinion, also a, a, what we're creating by closing up Dominguez is a safe area. Yeah, I believe so, yes. Okay, and then the other um, question that I had for you, Chief, is does the street closure cause any public safety issues for emergency vehicle needs? The Dominga? Yeah. No, because there's a, there's nothing set up in the roadway. So if an emergency vehicle has to come through, whether it's police or fire engine, people will get out of the way. There's okay. nothing to move. People will move. Right, so. just spread. Okay. So I have four more questions. One was, does the event have the support of the Dominga community? And based on what I saw last year, I don't think it's a one-time thing. Okay. And, and, so tradition, I, I think that that would be yes, but I didn't want to blow through any stop signs on this question to make sure I had everybody's support. Um, and are there any people opposed to this location for Halloween gathering? And I put that out there in the, the report too in case people didn't like this idea. Um, and what are the financial costs for the town in regard to police, garbage, bathrooms, any of that? Is that something we have to consider? Rhetorical question. Bathrooms, do we want to bring that up? Um, I remember, you know. It's certainly, I mean, it's never been provided before. I don't know if that's. Yeah. If you don't in front of Mrs. Bolino's house. Oh, and then, uh, uh, I was not expecting that. Um, what hours would be acceptable? I put on here 10 o'clock. I think that's, that's way too late. Um, but, I, but I hastily put in this report to put something in writing, and then I recognized that. Um, that was my 13-year-old side coming out and not my nine-year-old side coming out. Um, is, is nine o'clock, is, is eight o'clock, is 8.30? I mean, what, what, what time does it start to disperse? I was so caught up in the adventure last year, I don't know what time it, it ends on Dominga now I'm talking. You have an opinion? I'd love to hear it. Will you hit your microphone there? We can certainly use help with maybe half a dozen people that want to judge 
costumes so we get a better overall. We end up usually just picking someone who, at random, who doesn't really have the best costume. So we're working on an idea of four really wonderful gifts for the four very best costumes, and it's done by age. So if anybody has any input on that, they could email me. Oh, it should be over, I think, by 8.30, quarter to 9, like the latest. So, so maybe what we do is we just reopen the streets at 9, and I think people will start to get, I mean, my kids are going to be done by then, I know that, but it that's gives. That's pretty much the pattern. At 8.30, it starts to wind down by 9. It's so what would be the hours that we might think this would be closed from the beginning of the parade so people can actually start to just go there till 9? I mean, a four-hour window, is that? I think they like to encourage people to go to the park after the parade. My sense it, and I think that there are also people who live on Domingo who might like to get home before their street gets closed off. And so it might make more sense to have the Domingo closed off like six, six to, to nine. nine. Sure. That way people can kind of, and then, there, and then we give the residents an opportunity to, to get, get home, home before sure. six o'clock and sure. then six o'clock. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my two cents on it. Wendy's going around to all of the merchants to let them know because it happens so quickly. It starts pretty much right at 5 and it's over by, you know, 5.30, quarter to 6, the right. latest. So Thank the you. The la if I may. Uh, the last thing I just want to address to the community, and I, it's obvious people are watching this because one lady came down because she saw what was going on. I'll give you that to uh, the media center and Larry for setting that kind of discourse back and forth, which is fabulous. Um, I'd like to have someone from the Dominga uh, area step forward, come into the town and say, hey, I'll be the, the, the center where we can coordinate candy or, or treats or financial donations. A lot of people wanted to contribute last year and didn't know how to. And I think that the financial burden really should be addressed. Um, I'm not saying from the council perspective, but from the people that are going to participate down there, there's got to be something down there to donate to. If you get there late and, and, you, and you see what's going on, you obviously want to donate some money when you see how wonderful it is and um, how that would be dispersed between all the participating neighbors um, would be something that they would have to do on their own. But I want to encourage the participation of financial and uh, treats be donated so that we can help out. Yeah. And also at the outset, I mean, it's pretty hard to organize something like that. Adults bringing their kids down there, you know, it's pretty easy to pick up a bag of candy and you go to some house and they say, wow, we're almost out. You reach into your pocket and you hand them a bag of candy. I mean, it's informal, but it works. That's a great idea. Judy, did you have? I just wanted to say it's about the street closure, so I've reworded the resolution. And um, so I want to just read the part I changed so that you know what you're going to adopt here. If you're clear on the hours to close Dominga 6 to 9, is that what you were leaning toward, 6 to 9? Okay. Make any particular okay. decision on it, but right. yeah, but that's where we're, I think, leaning. Look, why don't I do, in, in the, unless there's something else from council, let me take public comment and we'll make a decision from there. Cindy? figure why not I've been talking all night tonight um, and I apologize my eyes are kind of crossing right now this really is past my bedtime but I really want to encourage you Halloween is my very very favorite holiday you know it has been for years and years and I just want to encourage you close the streets do whatever you can just to you know turn Fairfax into the you know the safe party environment that I think it should be and it might be too late for this year, but I really, really hope that we can bring back the haunted house because that, that was just one of the most amazing things. Maybe we could even, you know, tone it down a little bit so that it's maybe a little bit, you know, younger age, a little more friendly. I know it was kind of, you know, frightening for, for too young, but it was one of the most fun things that I've ever done. So I'd like to see that happen again, too. Well, as I know, that was an extraordinary volunteer effort that made that happen, and those volunteers, I think, uh, got uh, burnt out, <laughs> which happens. Speaking so. as one of those volunteers, yes. uh, it was so much fun to put it on. I'd put it on again. I think it was a money loser all the way through. Sure. Uh, it cost a lot of money to put it on, but it was, it was a great event. You're right.
Okay, so my guess, my understanding is kind of what we're considering at this point is no changes on Bellinus, uh, but hoping for for the the uh, chamber to police that as best as they can. Uh, and I'm actually I'm actually more than happy as my daughter reaches an age where she no longer has any interest in me trick or treating with her. I'm more than happy to to help out with kind of the security on. Keeping keeping kids on the sidewalk and and what have you. So I'll, I know you get you and Chris Lang usually. I mean maybe it'd be good for the chamber to kind of put out for for volunteers to make sure that we have folks in vests kind of keeping keeping the kids on the sidewalks and keeping an eye on folks. Um, but that we will uh, close Dominga from Pacheco to Creek from six to nine p.m. Is that what everybody? So, okay. Do you want to go through the the um, the resolution and other practices? Other practice of the candy business, I think, is going to have to kind of be worked out by the neighborhood. I, I don't think I need to read the whole thing. I'm just going to say the temporary closure of Dominga Avenue is necessary in order to safely facilitate the aftermath of the parade and to create a safe area for families, and that we will be doing it between six and nine. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make uh, a motion to adopt resolution 1266 as amended for temporary closure of Dominga uh, from Pacheco to Creek from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on Halloween, uh, October 31st, for a safe zone for motorized vehicles for children, ghosts, and goblins of all ages. Uh, motion O'Neill. Second. Second read. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion carries. Uh, Larry, item number 17. Thank you, Janet, for staying. <laughs> um, so, um, kind of a little change of pace here. Um, and th this really was um, added to kind of introduce um, what's happening um, in the watershed um, with, with the water district, um, which may have a significant impact on the community, um, given the community's historic uh, position and culture around uh, toxic pesticides uh, and toxic herbicides. And it's, it's somewhat um, particularly apt um, right now, because we've got Proposition 37 about GMOs, which really, as Valerie mentioned early, earlier, rather, i um, getting a little tired here, really does involve herbicides, glyphosates, and, and uh, 2,4-D is, is in the pipeline um, for commercial uh, GMO tolerance. So um, I... I'm not gonna, um, I, I'm gonna invite Janet to come up maybe and, and make a few comments uh, about what's happening with the water district. This has been an ongoing uh, process for many years. It's gone through two or three different phases about um, how the water district wants to manage, um, manage its land and there's three criteria that the water district really is um, guided by. One, obviously, water quality. Second, fire safety. And coming up third with probably a bullet is biodiversity, which has become um, a big concern with the district because of the inexorable creep um, that some of these species are, are making. In other words, the geography of the plants is expanding and it's very predictable and it's actually very um, um, provable because we have satellite pictures going back decades that show the expansion of uh, the weed um, and broom infestations on Mount Tam. Our area here is is next to is zone five. There's four five zones um, that have been designated in the vegetation management plan, um, and that's all set out in my report. And you can all and that's basically taken from the water district report. So, yeah.
Correct. And I don't want to jump the shark here um, if it's inappropriate, but I, I, I read it a number of times, so just clarify this for me. It says it's going to be unlawful for any person, and I'm, I'm assuming that's including the town, um, because we do own a fair amount of land in our open space committee, is um, acquiring ever more of it, um, to knowingly, obviously, you'd have to be some sort of idiot to sell or plant the stuff. <laughs> But to permit the following to exist, grow, and mature, and then if I have any of these miserable things on my property, I'm going to get fined for it, just as the town will be fined for it, just as Dr. Wall on his 99 acres, a broom factory is going to be fined for it. And how are we going to get rid of all this stuff? It's easy on my little, you know, scrub of a half an acre to get rid of it. But uh, what about the town and, you know? more rural landowners. Ryan. Well, let, let me explain, yeah. uh, first of all, what's going on. Right now, the Water District is trying to manage its land, okay? And its land is surrounded by other land. And it's going to be very difficult to manage uh, the problem unless there's a coordinated approach taken. So unless our town coordinates its policy with the water district, we're going to be in somewhat of a Sisyphean uh, process of trying to beat back uh, the broom in the water district that is being germinated in adjoining land. So the idea is not to create a punitive ordinance and set people up for failure or set people up for undue enforcement or intrusive enforcement. The idea is to create a legal framework um, in which uh, the worst uh, types of um, just negligent maintenance of property, we would have some sort of legal ability to go in and abate it. And so let, let me just finish, okay? No, 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 but I Could think, I finish? Yeah, I just want to say it dovetails with what John was sort of getting at uh, last Could time. Could I finish my comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If you don't have this, it's the water district, There's, it's not going to succeed. Um, and, you know, um, the the problem, if, if you want to call it a problem, we're, we're going to have no handle on it. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat, I put it on the agenda tonight for us to start thinking about it. Um, this, was, this is done in an effort to introduce the concept to the community and start a conversation about it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, have, have at it. No, no, it seems John sort of, you know, um, spun us off in this direction a, a month or so ago um, by bringing it up. Uh, if you are, and what we heard at the fire department under the fire code, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that they come around, they will tell you um, your property needs to have defensible space of X feet from the house. That has to be cleared back. And in fact, in our more dense neighborhoods, your 30 feet and your neighbor's 30 feet is going to result in uh, probably uh, wiping out broom in more of our more compact neighborhoods, in our more uh, hilly neighborhoods. I think that this is sort of getting at that problem. And so folks like me who have a little bit up there and have you know a, a recurring misery of 50 plants who like to come up every year no matter how many times I pull them out, pull them out um, is, is one thing. I'm sort of like looking at sort of the, as Larry says, you know, the, the big time actors here, the larger landowners who I just don't know how they would possibly get at this, or even the town itself through its open space acquisitions, which are um, riddled um, with this misery. Um, so we are going to have to step it up and figure out how we're going to do it, just as uh, the Water District um, is trying to do as well. So, so the idea is just to set some kind of legal framework for the town. Uh, it's too late um, tonight to really get into it, and I don't think we should be 
talking to an empty room about it, really. So, you know, I, I'd be happy to hear Janet's comment, who's been sitting here for so long. Um, you know, and I mentioned it to Janet when I went to their outreach a few weeks ago um, that it seems that the water district needs some kind of support from the surrounding communities to manage the issue instead of just going at it alone. So I'd, I'd like to hear what she's got to say. So I'm Janet Klein, and I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager with the Marin Municipal Water District, and I work out of the Sky Oaks Ranger Station. And at 11.30 at night, I really don't have very much to say, because um, I can't even remember why I'm here. So um, I, I guess what I, on, on behalf of the district, what we really wanted to do was show up at a, a council meeting and let you know that the draft vegetation management plan for the watershed is now up on our website and that we will be sometime within the next month formally opening the environmental review process and the plan is to prepare a programmatic EIR. So sometime in the next month the notice of preparation will come out with the date for the public scoping meeting and the, the extent and the dates of the formal scoping meeting um, that opens the EIR process. We expect the EIR will take about six months, seven months to prepare, and then there will be a minimum 45-day comment period on the EIR. And we um, feel very strongly that the town, town of Fairfax has a really unique stake in the outcome of this whole process, given your proximity to the watershed lands, and that um, you are located um, in an area with the, among the highest fire risk, I think second only to Mill Valley, and the densest stands of invasive species and some of the greatest recreational um, access likely to be impacted by weed species and some of the most precious natural resources. And so we really want the town of Fairfax as a community to be active participants in the process. So that's really kind of all I wanted to do has, for opening and to let us all go home and then say if you guys would like um, a specialized meeting with us we will come down and meet with you we will tour you around I know um, David I think Larry did you come out on a tour back back in the day um, I, I know that David came out with us once um, and Frank Egger did and we pile you up in a van and we drive the fire roads and we look at the fuel breaks from great height and we look at different things that we have tried to do and this issue of what happens on our borders and what our neighbors does is huge and I really commend Larry for starting to think that next step for how we can all do our part. And now that I'm a resident of Fairfax, it's become much more personal to me um, than when this process started many, many, many years ago. So um, I'll answer any quick questions and I'll get you, I'm hopefully, have you all received notices from the district sort mm -hmm. of to this effect? Okay, so that system is working great. But um, I think, you know, talking to the staff up at the ranger station would be a great next step for you guys. When do you expect to? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I think that maybe the next best step would be for you to potentially come and do a presentation that will allow it to be something that happens at the very beginning of our meeting <laughs> instead of at the very end. Um, and it also gives us a, a, an opportunity to get better education on, uh, educated on what the current vegetation management plan is. Does that, Larry, seem like the, the next best step for us to sort of take in order to head in this direction because I think it's the right direction for us to head in. Yeah, I mean, th there's going to be a public process that's going to begin whatever in the next few months. Um, but, you know, if you guys have the resources and, and want to come in, um, I mean, honestly, I've got some, you know, real concerns about the direction that I think the water district is going to go because um, it seems, you know, axiomatic in this day and age that governmental agencies make decisions um, based in large part by financial considerations and the way the study is is set up and the plan is set up I mean there's the financial comparisons between conventional and I'll just call pesticide and herbicide use conventional versus non-conventional control. Um, there's huge cost differences built into the equation. Um, 
And that's a real concern for me because I don't think we should be putting um, herbicides into the watershed. Um, the one comment uh, you made during the presentation which kind of struck me is, you know, we're talking about a minuscule amount compared to the amount that is drenching our food crops, our gardens, and our driveways. And, uh, you know, I, I do understand that, but um, it's a real concern to me that we would set as a public policy the tolerance and um, um, acceptance of using pesticide in our drinking water watershed. So um, I, that, I guess that's in response to do, do I want the issue to be framed by the water district? It's a great presentation, and if you, in the study, the way the study's done by breaking down the watershed into zones, I think is really interesting. Uh, because if, if we could, I think if you really take it zone by zone, um, we can, and, and you eliminate some, some of the work in zone five, which is our zone, the cost comparison between conventional and non-conventional control is much more favorable uh, to non-conventional because 60, 70 percent of the expense is in zone five, and that's us. So the reason I really was motivated to bring this was to see can we as a town, as a community, contribute to that non-toxic eradication and control or management of the problem. So, um, yeah, I guess we should have the water district come in. I just, I mean, I just hate to really see it sort of like framed uh, completely by that presentation, so. Um, one thing I'd sort of like to say to that is that the plan has drafted right now has both a fully developed alternative that has herbicides integrated into it and a fully developed alternative that has zero herbicides integrated into it. And the district board is committed to us running the EIR process with those two alternatives fully evaluated as equals. Um, and part of the process going forward within the EIR, you know, as part of the EIR process is the opportunity to develop additional alternatives. So my own opinion is it is not a foregone conclusion that the district knows which way it's going to go. Yeah. Um, and just in terms of my own relationship with the board members, I think they're still very open to, to multiple outcomes. Yeah. Um, and, and I really don't think that the herbicide determination is a foregone conclusion at this point. And I think that that's why greater community input is really valuable at this junction. Yeah. Um, but there ha you have to have a starting point, and so the plan is on the table, has a starting point for conversation, which is now extremely specific. So back when we started, it was a very generalized conversation, so we can lay out some of the specifics for you to, to engage in. Um, so I am happy to, to show up at a meeting and do that. It generally takes us a, a minimum of 20 minutes to kind of lay it out. It's a giant chunk of work, um, and it's still a flyover um, at, at that level. Um, but I'm happy to give me a date, give me a, a time frame, and we'll do it. Um, and then again, I think that site tour is is huge to sort of wrapping your mind around at the scale of it. And then if you're serious and going forward with a noxious weed ordinance, looking at those boundary issues is is a big piece of that too. You know, then I guess we need to start. Absolutely. You know, and and. Um, it, it, with the council's uh, indulgence, then I mean, then I think we should have you in when you're comfortable coming in. And you know, my intent in putting it on is really to open the conversation and to get us thinking about what we can do and how we want to approach it. Because um, you know, at this point, um, you know, broom, as I said in the report, it's been cultivated in the United States now for a hundred years. And um, I'm not so sure how non-native it is. I, I know it is definitely invasive and it definitely has impacts. And I guess I'm just trying to figure out with you or contribute something to get the conversation uh, to, for us to innovate and collaborate 
together to really address the issue um, and maybe come up with something creative. David, did you have another comment? You lost so in, in the weeds listed, are, are we in agreement that broom and all the other stuff is an invasive disaster? Or, or what the, the ordinance that I, I really cut and pasted into the report is the Marin County Noxious Weed Ordinance. And I added broom species and star thistle to the list. Um, I don't know. Are have you? Are do you I, know? Has the ag commissioner added broom and uh, star thistle to the, the county list? That that list comes from the state, and so there is a state noxious weed list that is set by law, um, and they are virtually all agricultural lists. They're they're species that are identified as having economic impacts in agricultural settings. Um, and the list is tiered. There are A, B, and C species. And so agricultural commissioners throughout the state have the authority to mandate eradication for things with an A listing. And then they have a certain degree of discretion at the B list. So broom, I believe, shows up, at, the brooms show up as a C. Um, none of those species that are on, on that, that, that you listed in your draft ordinance are currently in the commercial trade. You cannot go to um, a, a nursery and find them. Um, there are brooms for sale um, in the ornamental trade, but none of them are the invasive brooms on the watershed. There's one sterile broom, or it's believed to be sterile broom called Cytisus racemosa that looks very much like scotch broom, but is not scotch broom, and that's the only one I've seen in the nurseries. And at both the state and the county level, there have been issues to um, to add additional regulation within the horticultural trade to restrict species that have the potential to go invasive, like periwinkle or forget-me-nots or pampas grass is still in the, the nurseries. And there have been, um, I mean, it's been an ongoing effort for 20 years, and they've met with very limited success. Um, so it's been, but there have been some successful grassroots efforts around Home Depots and targets to limit certain species but but thus far i mean that's it hasn't been a a happy tale um, but i mean i can provide a lot of additional information at another time on on those specifics if you want it yeah i mean you know i mean i'm familiar in the midwest you know if you if you have certain weeds on your property they come in and abate it and that's it and i'm not suggesting and it, it they are they are the they are the weeds that affect commercial agriculture so, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit different and we're kind of breaking new ground here a little bit. But um, I think we, if we don't break new ground, we at least have to kind of check it out and, and see if there's anything we can do to, um, I, I think, resolve the issue in a sustainable way. And, you know, and to me that means no herbicide, no herbicide, no pesticides in that watershed. Um, and uh, to, the, to the extent that Fairfax really abuts the watershed, um, we need to take responsibility to help manage the problem and, um, and help if we can. So that, that's the intent of the um, item from my perspective. Thank you. John, did you? Um, yeah, I just want to th I, th I think it's really important that you brought this forward. And uh, I mean, I've been getting your I mean, from my previous work with the volunteers and stuff, it's a gargantuan volunteer effort to get people out to pull broom and, and manage this. And that's certainly, you know, one avenue that's been tried. And it is, you know, the guy rolling the boulder up. And I saw you taking notes to look that up later. Huh? So it's rolling the boulder up the mountain. You get to the top and the boulder rolls back down to the bottom and you put it back up. Anyway. Um, It's huge, and I think we've got to work together with the district because a lot of our lands are just as, uh, you know, David was saying, you know, we have huge problem on land that's in Fairfax that's adjacent, and we really need to work together on it. Um, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm sure you've explored goats. I know you have to an extent, but that's one of the things that comes up for me. I mean, I've seen them gobble up poison oak and stuff like that, so we've got to solve this problem. So. 
Ryan. Briefly, because it is getting late, um, I will point out that um, Councilmember Bragman did use the word Sisyphean and axiomatic after 11 o'clock, which should be outlawed. <laughs> but um, really quickly to challenge people too, you know, there was a problem at one point with tires. What do we do with all these tires? If anyone could ever figure out what to do with tires, they'd be rich. Well, they did. They figured it out if you grind them up and put them on artificial turf as the little breakings that, you know, they found a need for it. They found a use for it. Um, and, and if you can look at um, these products, sawdust, what did they do with sawdust? They, had made, they made them into Duraflame logs. If we could ever figure out or a way to take broom and make it worth 50 cents a pound, it would all be gone. So it's almost like I, I love the concept that you brought forward because I don't believe in pesticides in any fashion for the environment. But if we could somehow as a community put heads together to figure out something to turn it into to make it a commodity that people would want to harvest and get rid of, then we really have the answer. Thank you. Um, and I know we need to take public comment before we bring it back to, is there any public comment? Seeing none, I will close public comment. Um, and this was a discussion, so we, there's nothing really for us to vote on, but we'll definitely bring you back. Thank you, Janet. Yes. Let me just, um, there is an outside chance that the public scoping meeting on the EIR will be as early as November 15th. Ooh. Um, because we're trying to get it in before the holidays, um, you know, in that dreaded Christmas Thanksgiving thing. So um, I, that's, I just want you to know that when you're trying to figure out when you want to bring us in. Great. Okay? That's it. Thank you. Um, it is past 11.30. Can we make an agreement? Is there any urgency on the sign? Can we just hold off no, on that? Can I just month? make a comment? The reason I put it on the agenda, okay, I mean, I really don't mean to offend David on this item, but it just, it occurred to me, if we take the sign out, the folks on that east end of town are not gonna see the announcements. And so that is why I brought it back, because a lot of folks that live in that neighborhood, they're just gonna turn and go home. And they're not gonna come down, they're not gonna go past the parkade and see an announcement. So my feeling is that it's a mistake to, t to take a sign out that gives notice to the folks on the east end of town that may never even come into the parkade. And the people who come in on center and then head their merry way uh, down to Domingo, let's say, um, they never see a sign at all. It's, it's a rather, it's, it's a charming, but it's an anachronism. People at this point have many avenues and ways to find out uh, about our meetings, planning commission meetings, but I think that uh, that sign is, um, is, is, is uh, you know, not a leading uh, opportunity for people to find the stuff. Um, I mean, why not, why not add, I mean, I, the idea of making the one sign at the parkade raising it so that it can be used. No, just to add to it in a temporary manner, probably with one of our extraordinary woodworkers in this town, um, to add that there. And then when we get into the more permanent signage thing, if the GPIC comes back to us with, with recommendations, what I'm suggesting is the, the theme here was, t in my opinion, tired, dilapidated signs sitting under some miscropped redwoods in the back of a supermarket next to the grand monument that appropriately uh, entrances the folks to uh, the good earth. It is not the place to uh, identify, hey, you're entering into Fairfax. That truly is more of our park, the more business center of the town where the, I would say the iconic sign um, resides currently that can be amended uh, one way or another to add the uh, that information. I don't really think people are going to be diminished in their opportunity to know of our meetings and that of the commission if it comes down. You, you know, and uh, my suggestion would be, by all means, you know, add or raise the sign in the parkade that you mentioned to to give folks an additional opportunity. But I think taking away an opportunity or making folks having to tr even to travel two blocks. Um, is not a great idea. So exactly what I raised last time, which is no change, no improvement to Fairfax can ever happen without hubbub. Um, it's it's a it's a it was appropriate perhaps at one time back in the day. It's 
inadequate now and it's diminished by its location and it's just my opinion and my and my sense and and i i see that sign every single day as i come down willow and go that way and and i i guess part of what came up for me is are you offended by the the thing the notices that hang on the sign or the sign itself the sign itself not the notice what's wrong with it well it's this is just a question of uh <laughs> what, what you feel for 17 almost yeah, 17 yeah. years now i come down i look at that thing and um it's sitting behind the utility cabinets behind a supermarket and that says to people as they mm -hmm. enter our great town welcome to fairfax um and i look at it and say no that really should not be the welcoming entrance sign. The monument, the you know, if, if Jim was here, he would he would talk about you know the, the the concept of the entrance of the town and the and the importance of that. It's written up in our general plan. I, th I think that this might be more than a past 11.30 p.m. conversation than a brief comment. Can we not make any changes until next month and bring this and bring this Sounds back on good. the agenda? Because Last month, yeah, I brought up the same objections that Larry did, and I guess I abstained last month because you did. Yeah, it's. I feel the same way. I mean, it serves a function, and it, so if it looks horrible or if let's it's have got, this conversation like yeah. next month. <laughs> let's, yeah, have let's have the conversation, have the conversation next, month. next month. Um, I, I would like to make a if motion it bad, to let's adjourn. Something nice around it. Um, I we're gonna actually have it on next month for a real actual consideration rather than rather than trying to have half of a consideration past our 11:30 stopping well, make, point make a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn uh o'neill second bragman all in favor say aye. aye any opposed seeing none thank you for the late night folks